nerderotic.com. everyone welcome to the nerd rotic nooner my name is gary beekler i come to you from nerd rotic and i am live in poop city california lovely san francisco and today's a big day because i'm going to be interviewed on a local tv show called creature features and i'm looking forward to that got to do that tonight and uh until then uh, that means i uh, won't be making a video today so it freed me up to live stream and of course there will be no exo zone today unfortunately i am sorry to say uh doomcock is doing his uh show tonight friday night frolics will be tonight so whoops god dang it that's professional and uh <laughs> sorry <laughs> um i've got to work out the scenes on this thing i've been meaning to do it i know how to do it i just haven't done it yet so there can be smooth transitions. Uh, but yes, uh, Doomcock's doing Friday Night Frolics tonight, and, and uh, I'm doing this instead of us doing the Exozone, which will come back next week. And of course, I'll have Friday Night Tights tomorrow. And tomorrow morning, I will be covering The Mandalorian. The Mandalorian. Uh, it's 8 p.m. in Germany. Well, good morning. Good evening. Good evening in Germany. And welcome, Nick uh mcclechy and it's a trap productions young ripa what's up dude how's it going bear 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 nerd fun is here and he's going to be on friday night tights tomorrow matthew matson our mod rotic uh i believe we have christy did i see christy according to christy yes and nicholas horton a member uh and stephen vale man bear pig uh keck 44 mongoose mcqueen andrew grimm uh, John Deloroso, uh, De La Rosso, and Tom, and what's this, a Dakin, Dakin Lover, Tectonics Architects, Mason W, 14 Barber, Alabama, uh, that one jumped on me, I'll just say Alabama, Rebecca Gold is here, uh, which is a web show and it's cool, uh, I do like independent creators, and I think that's the way we need to go. And uh, the Phantom Menace is here. What's up? Nina Fabiano, Fixie Clary, uh, the Feral Wolf, and Carlos, Clone Captain Blasto. Welcome, everybody. So today, we're going to talk about the Rise of Skywalker leaks. We're going to go over them because uh, Bear 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 Nerd Fun sent me the updated ones. And it looks like they're, uh, <laughs> it looks like Game of Thrones all over again. What's up, canceled Jeremy? <clears throat> And we are also going to go over Alex Kurtzman's Vanity Fair review. It is eye-opening. So if you ever wondered, you know, why does Alex Kurtzman get work? How does this talentless hack run Star Wars? Good team player. He's a good team player. He will push whatever politics he is asked, asked to push. He will say whatever he's asked to say. He is a corporate tool. A perfect corporate tool. And when you see what he's worked on, uh, you'll understand why Star Trek Discovery is so filled with agenda. <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they also, you all will also see why they chose the casting they did. I will preface, I don't have a problem with a black female captain in Star Trek. That is very Star Trek. I don't have a problem with anything as far as anybody's gender, where they like to put their junk. 
I don't care. It's Star Trek. I understand that. I just want it to be Star Trek, but it's not. It's Star Trek in name only. It's a propaganda piece. And when you hear uh, what went through their minds when they casted uh, this show, it was not based on merit. Spoilers. Uh, and you know what? That's got to stick in the actor's head at all times. I'm sure you, nobody's going to say no to the job. I wouldn't either. Uh, but you got to think, <clears throat> was this white dude casting me to be a virtue signal? Was he casting me to make a point instead of my talent, uh, my charisma, my ability to do my job? Uh, and these are the games that Hollywood is playing and you want to talk about deceitful, despicable, deplorable, that's what Hollywood is doing. It's the most superficial place on the planet. They don't, there's nothing genuine about this town. They don't care about your cause at all. They care about their cause and using you to push their cause. And that's why Alex Kurtzman is perfect. And that's why Star Trek is doomed. <clears throat> on, the, on the good news note, on the good news note, on December 13th, something will be arriving on Amazon Prime that is better than Star Wars, that is better than Star Trek, that is better than Doctor Who, that is better than most television out there. It's called The Expanse. Uh, I highly recommend people go check it out. I will say it's not for everybody because it is the most hardcore of hardcore sci-fi. It's very grounded. Uh, and uh, they really get into the weeds and stuff. Uh, there's a lot of characters. It's very complex. And it's a lot like Game of Thrones, it, the beginning, anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, they are about to make a huge mistake. Uh, not narratively. The show, I've already seen the first episode of season four, and it's, one, uh, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, they're going to make a huge mistake because I'm sure all of you know, because I've been talking, if you've been with the channel for six years, this is the one thing I have been on since I started this channel. The binge model is stupid. It's unsustainable. It costs too much money. And it doesn't help your show at all unless your show is a massive, massive hit. And I still think you're leaving a lot of money, uh, a lot of free advertising on the table when you could. Uh, it, and we'll go over some numbers today because I've got time. And we're going to go over some numbers and we're going to show The Expanse how much free advertising they're leaving behind. Uh, because I'm not letting this one go. Now, I don't know if they're dropping it all at once because they haven't said anything that I know of. And if somebody in the chat wants to correct me, I would I would love to be sit corrected. So, let's uh, hail. Hail to the Modrotics. Uh, Pedro, get your money. Clamcasting again. What's up, young Ripa? Uh, I, uh, hey, um, I hate to do this publicly, but I'd love to get you on Friday Night Tights. If you're not live streaming sometime, I will DM you on Twitter. And if you would like to join us, I would love to have you on. We've, I've had, I've had him on before is a great YouTuber, a uh, good person. Uh, and I agree with a lot of his politics. Um, <clears throat> so Chris Persia, how are you? I guess we'll start again. Bear, 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 nerd fun. Thank you. Hail, sir. Uh, and also I want to shout out author Stephen Walton, uh, who is the author of the Fandom Menace book, Volume 1. It would be multiple volumes. And uh, my brother in recovery, Sporking News Podcast. They do. Uh, there's somebody else on the show, and I'm forgetting. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, they do a live stream called The Fourth Wave. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Go check it out. All right. So let's uh, start out with the leaks, because uh, we got to work our way up to Star Trek, because that one's... Uh, uh, you know what? I had forgotten how much... Uh, Star Trek has irritated me. Uh, quite frankly, it's worse than Star Wars because I don't care about Star Wars anymore. I'm I'm not a Star Wars fan anymore, so it's it's kind of nice. I'm objectively reviewing The Mandalorian, uh, and I can enjoy it as just a you know a, a normie, a total Star Wars, not even a Star Wars normie, just a normie, somebody watching a television show, and I wouldn't differentiate it from uh, CSI, quite honestly. And 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 to be fair. Uh, the Mandalorian's good. It's very good. Uh, as far as complexity, though, it's about as complex as a CSI episode. Uh, right. So what we have here is a failure to communicate. No. Um, we have the leaks. Let's bring them up, shall we? You get rid of my face. And there we go. 
All right, so what we have here in bold, um, I did a video on the this a couple of days ago and I focused on the Palpatine stuff. But um, when I heard Jar Jar Abrams was coming back to the Rise of Skywalker, I in jest said he'll probably just make it an episode of Alias. And it looks like it's an episode of Alias. So we have Ray Bristow uh, running around the galaxy searching for MacGuffins for uh, Section six, 6, known as the Resistance. I, it was Section 6? It was called Section 6. It's been a long time since I watched the show. Uh, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, and we will go over the bold text. Uh, you know, EFAP, a lot of people have gone over this. Uh, but we saw that image yesterday of uh, Uche's uh, blade. Uh, uh, not Uche from Geeks and Gamers. Uh, Uche. So it's a, it's a Sith assassin who was sent out to, to get Rey's parents to abduct Rey or something like that. And the Sith assassin apparently... Uh, when they're done doing their work, their work, they engrave their blade, and the blade looks terrible. I don't have a picture of it right now, but it looks, it looks bloody awful. I can probably find one in a second here. Uh, let me take a look. Rise of Skywalker. Uchi's blade. Uh, 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 uh. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Uh, no, I can't. So I'll, I'll find it in a second. Um, all right. And we're going to start out with, according to my sources, uh, the scene uh, uh, the scene with, and this is what the Reddit leak says, the, the scene with Luke and Leia, or Luke training Leia de-aged. I don't know if this scene ever existed. This will be the one scene I'd want to see. And they, they got rid of it. Uh, and I would, uh, that's a lot like, George Lucas removing the scene from the beginning of Return of the Jedi, which I've always hated, which was Luke putting together his lightsaber and actually becoming a Jedi at that moment. According to my sources, this scene is no longer in the opening of the film and may be cut entirely in favor of dialogue between Rey and the ghost of Luke later on in the film. Uh, the current opening is as follows. The film is now apparent now apparently begins with a shot of a control tower rising from the ground of a planet. The control tower begins transmitting a signal. Some rumbling below the surface of the planet begins, and then the star destroyers of the Sith fleet break through the dark, rocky surface of the planet and rise into the air. I'm wondering if that's ice. Uh, that would be, that'd be incredible if the star destroyers could break through like actual rock. Uh, then they wouldn't have a problem in an asteroid field. Apparently, this change was made to establish the fleet as a threat from the very beginning, as well as coordinating or, or coordinate with or coordinate with changes made to the back half of the film during reshoots. Now, um, to explain a little bit how Jar Jar Abrams does his filmmaking, Jar Jar Abrams believes its characterization if somebody just walks onto a screen and says, hey, you're gay. Uh, that he believes that's enough characterization for somebody uh, and, and character depth. Telling you something in one sentence. That's Jar Jar Abrams' characterization. And that's why a lot of his films and TV shows feel hollow, because they are. Uh, Supreme Leader Kylo Ren has been aware of a dark power behind his predecessor and former master Snoke. Kylo has been spending his time as leader of the First Order with the purpose of locating this power. General Cux and Pride have been following Kylo around on this quest and are beginning to get frustrated with what they see as a fool's errand. They see this as a waste of fir the First Order time and resources. When we catch up with the villains of our story, Kylo is leading an assault on the planet with the purpose of finding Darth Vader's Wayfinder device. The device reveals coordinates within the unknown regions, and Kylo is confident that this will reveal the source of Snoke's power. Kylo Ren slaughters his way through the natives. And this is a scene where they were going to go find the Oracle. Uh, according to my sources, the Oracle se sequence has been removed from the film in the wake of reshoots in favor of the following. Kylo walks toward a castle tower described to me as similar to the style of Vader's scene in Rogue One and finds the Wayfinder in a chest. 
uh, because yeah, it's just there. Prior to getting the Wayfinder, Kylo had, uh, cause it's been sitting there for 30 years, maybe, you know, who knows? Uh, what was described to me as a split second PTSD flashback to Luke and Han. When this me what this means exactly is unknown to me, but my source made it clear that the voiceover and flashbacks of this nature may be very easy to drop in and out. So it's possible they might not make the final cut of the film. Kylo then hears a voice that the audience should be able to identify as Palpatine calling Kylo, Kylo to come to him. Come to me. Do it. Do it. Feel it growing inside you. Oh, sorry. Uh, apparently, Kylo killing natives is toned down a bit to provide a smoother transition between evil Kylo in the beginning and good Ben at the end. Because we've established uh, that he's a bad guy. I don't, I don't think he's bad. I think he's a petulant teenager. Uh, I'm also told that the Oracle was removed because it was deemed too confusing for audiences. Yes, too many red herrings can be very confusing. Reshoots have apparently amended Ray's mental training to be focused around trying to communicate with past Jedi who have uh, become one with the Force. Reshoots have added a greater sense of anger in Ray during her physical training. In her anger, she cuts down a tree and it falls on BB-8 and damages him. After her training, she tries to communicate with Luke, asking him to appear to her, but nothing happens. I'm sure it's Luke's fault. Ray gives her lightsaber to Leia, feeling that she is undeserving of it. Well, that's an accurate scene. The reason why is uh, the reason why this was added is it seems to establish Ray's struggle with anger. Oh, you're trying to give Ray layers now. Very good. And an inability to commune with the dead Jedi earlier in the film, making her success in the end over her struggles more impactful, making her less of a Mary Sue. So that's just an acknowledgement to me, if it's true. Again, these I don't know. I don't know. Uh, as Kylo descends, he passes... Okay, so I've already gone over this in my uh, video. Uh, I want to get to the part where we are looking for U Uchi. Um... The Resistance reviews the information gleaned from the data recorder. That's another MacGuffin. They find out about the, the Sith fleet and Palpatine's return. I'm told that cloning is once again discussed as a possibility, but it isn't confirmed or denied here. And again, if you watch my video, it is a possibility that they might not definitively answer how Palpatine got back. And I can certainly see them doing it. This part pisses me off. Snoke is apparently dismissed as a pawn at... As work uh, as a pawn for Emperor Palpatine, uh, as he plotted his way back to power from the unknown regions, so that that's that's all Snoke gets right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, Finn apparently voices his concern over the children that will need to be kidnapped, as he was ordered to staff a fleet of his of this scale. I'm told that this section was added in reshoots to provide more clarity to what's going on in the film. So to get this right, Jar Jar Abrams probably came up with the idea of hundreds of Star Destroyers and an image without even thinking about how do we man these? What, what, kind, what kind of resources do we need to make this go? How, how, I did the numbers on Twitter. It was just an estimate, but it was somewhere in the millions. Uh, 100 Star Destroyers, uh, 100 Star Destroyers would require a million people to run. And uh, because uh, I looked up on w Wikipedia how many uh, actual crew members and officers are on a Star Destroyer, and I'm not counting, like, staff and passengers. Uh, and you can look it up, too. But it's it's somewhere in the millions. Uh, a room full of high-ranking First over Order of officers is gathered. Hux and Pride are among them. Bulio's head is apparently thrown onto the table. Kylo states that the room in the room that he knows that there is a spy within the First Order. Kylo seems to be okay with this because it will draw Rey out of hiding. I'm told that... <laughs> what? Uh, I'm told that one of the officers suggests that the Sith fleet cannot be trusted and this officer is subsequently choked, shoved into the ceiling and dropped to the floor by Kylo. I'm told this was added to give more clarity to the dynamic between the First Order and the Sith Fleet. It is also established that Kylo is still the one calling the shots within the First Order and answers the question of what happened to Poe's contact. 
Before taking off, uh, a few things were apparently added in reshoots. Leia gives Rey her lightsaber back, and Maz gives Rey a little pep talk before she leaves. So we have to we have to pass the Bechdel test here. So we have to have a uh, a female mentoring another female in two separate scenes while they're not talking about a man, which is fine. I'm glad that's going into Star Star Wars. Uh, Ray tells the crew that Luke left behind some notes and coordinates within the Jedi text she stole from the tree library on Achu uh, that described a Sith artifact that might help them. One of my sources says that they go to Pasana to seek out a hermit that Luke knew. This is where the festival festival is, the Burning Man. Uh, it happens every 42 years. Okay, I see what they're doing there. Little little homage to Douglas Adams. Uh, there's that scene with the necklace, and I'll, I'll get to the chat in just a second. We'll take a little break here in just a second. But according to my context, they interact. Uh, cons the interaction consists of the following: Kylo antagonizes, and this is a Ray and Kylo antagonizes her about her parents leaving her and selling her. Tells her she feels all alone, and there's nobody who understands her except him. Oh my God, he's trying to trap her in an abusive relationship. Uh, Kylo analyzes the necklace that they get from uh, that they stole from Ray on his Star Destroyer and finds out where it's from. Uh, Ray travels through the crowds to warn her friends of the First Order's knowledge of where she is. The First Order stormtroopers show up and ambush them. We've seen that in the trailer again. I don't know if this was updated after watching the trailer. I don't know. Luke and Lando's quest for Sith relics. Apparently, Luke and Lando were going looking for Sith relics. Uh, and Uche. So uh, the dagger wasn't part of their search, and it doesn't come into play until later. I'm now hearing Uche, uh, not Uche of Geeks and Gamers, of Bastoon as a possible more complete name for this character. Don't quote me on the spelling or the pronunciation, but I'm sure it'll at least sound pretty close to that when it is said and done. Lando tells of how he and Luke have been searching the galaxy for Sith artifacts and spent some time tracking Uche uh, due, to his, due to his knowledge of the Wayfinders. They eventually track him to Pasadena, I'm just going to call it Pasadena, and find his ship... Uh, but no Uche. Now, uh, yes, the First Order is... Uh, apparently, Lando believes that the First Order had a goal of turning the children of heroes of the Rebellion into their own enemies as a form of revenge. So they've been... So they've been kidnapping millions of children, the First Order has. Uh, and by the way, the First Order apparently has been working without the knowledge that Palpatine's behind it. Or some people knew and Kylo didn't know and Snoke know and didn't tell Kylo... Um, this is what happens when you don't plan out a plot. It sounds, uh, it, it, it sounds really bad. It, this sounds horribly bad. Uh, the sound of first order tie uh, fighters can be heard. Apparently Lando is the one who delivers the line. I have a bad feeling about this. <sighs> so, uh, we are trying to get to, it is discovered that Uche was not just a Sith loyalist. But he was a Sith assassin. You know, like Cecil says, don't underestimate the assassin's blade. They can come out of nowhere and take out the Night King, even if they're a 12-year-old girl. And it doesn't matter where they came from. It doesn't matter how they got there. Uh, but what does matter is it was really hard to shoot that TV show. Uh, they find the dagger among the remains, and Ray recalls that it was a tradition for Sith assassins to inscri inscribe secrets on them. That is the most Jar Jar Abrams freaking alias thing ever. Uh, I, I, I could see a Sith assassin. I mean, they take, you know, months of planning. They take out a dignitary and then they wipe their blade clean and then they sit down and start writing on it. That's, that's efficient. Uh, according to the updated information, C3 Brio can read it. He knows what it says and tells the resistance crew that it reveals the location to a wayfinder, but his programming for forbids him from providing a literal translation of the text. Of course, again, it's a chase for a MacGuffin. Sidney Bristow gets a USB, uh, gets a USB. Sorry, uh, 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 my brain farted right there. Uh, Sidney Bristow runs to uh, Rome to get a thumbnail, USB thumbnail that's got a code on it, but it's only part of the code and then she's got to go to Honolulu, Hawaii and meet a guy named Sam who remembers the other part of the code but he miss he's missing the last letter of the code. So her and Sam 
go to Russia where Sam gets killed and they get the last letter of the code. And then Sydney uh, decodes the message and finds out she has to go get a Rimbaldi device from Sloan in New England. That's alias. Uh, and it's just a constant it's mystery box. It doesn't matter what's in the box. It's about the box, the box. What's in the box? Um, some additional footage has been added to both Kylo and Ray's reactions to drive some, uh, the sense of shock and denial of what happened. Um, the dagger has, okay, I'm going to shoot back up here. Uh, the dagger has writing on it in a language that nobody can understand. Okay. Chewbacca takes possession of the dagger and the group's attention shifts to finding a way uh, out of the caves. During their escape attempt, uh, the team runs into a giant, very aggressive sandworm, where pres presumably created uh, the which presumably created the tunnels. A battle with the sandworm ensues, and our heroes end up backed in a corner, preparing to meet their fate. When Ray notices a detail, the worm is injured. In a display of previously unknown power, Ray is able to heal the worm's injuries. Uh, sat, oh, oh, okay. Uh, and, and providing the heroes the chance they needed to escape. Once the crew exits the cave system, they see a First Order destroyer in the sky. Of course, of course. And it's Kylo, Kylo Ren has found them. Once they realize they correctly, uh, the reason that the First Order would have already found the Falcon, making the plan to escape impossible. In an act of desperation, the crew boards Uche's ship in an attempt to get it working. Rey senses that Kylo is coming for her, so she takes off on her own to confront him and buy her friend some time. And this is that stupid scene where Kylo Ren... Uh, doesn't use his blasters on the TIE fighter to shoot Ray and just charges at her so she can do an awesome, inexplicable black backflip. Uh, Chewbacca splits from the crew and attempts to delay the knights, the Knights of Ren came, uh, but is captured. The dagger is taken from him and he boards the First Order prisoner transport. Ray and Kylo both notice Chewbacca being taken captive and being brought to the transport ship during their confrontation. As the ship takes off, Ray shifts her attention from Kylo to her captured friend and begins to use the force to stop the transport and pull it back to the ground. <laughs> Kylo attempts to counteract this by pushing the ship away. Control over the ship becomes a battle between Kylo and Ray, much like their battle for Anakin's lightsaber in The Last Jedi. Kylo begins to gain the upper hand, uh, which angers Ray. In her frustration, lightning shoots from her hands, destroying the transport ship and killing all of its passengers. Was Chewbacca on that ship? Uh, devastating uh, what she did, Ray collapsed. Devastated by what she did, Ray collapses. Uh, I thought Chewbacca was on that ship. So is Chewbacca dead or did I misread that? Oh, well, uh, I'm sure he's not. Uh, some additional footage has been added of both Kylo and Ray's reactions to drive home the sense of shock and denial of what just happened. While all this uh, is transpiring, Poe Finn, 3 p on BB-8, uh, getting Uch Uchi's ship in the air in time to fly over and pick up a distraught Ray with no Lando, no Falcon, no Dagger, and no Chewbacca, our heroes limp away from the desert planet. Uh, an additional scene was shot where they find out that they do not have possession of the dagger because Chewbacca had it. But all of this is lost because 3PO has its message stored in, in its memory. A plan to hack 3PO's programming uh, restrictions is formed and they set course to Kajimi. Uh, BB-8 finds and reboots D.O. on Uchi's ship. Uh, the heroes of the Resistance make their way to a snow-dusted planet of Kajimi to execute their plan to discover what secrets the dagger it held, holds. The Resistance team arrives on the planet, and they bump into Zora Bliss, uh, the person who can decode the message, probably, and her crew. She reveals that Poe has a colorful, ba colorful, colorful past. Isn't it great when you get uh, characterization in uh, the final, uh, final movie? Uh, once... Uh, function he once functioned as a spice runner and still owes her money of course we have to get poe in trouble with another wham and uh, a quick skirmish occurs where ray gets the upper hand and zori agrees to bring them to babu frick babu frick babu frick uh all right well let's see what you guys are saying here we're gonna take a little break from this 
and I'm going to just get, I want to get through just the dagger parts because uh, I think that's very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think Chewbacca's dead. They're, they're probably just making you think he is. Yeah, I think because he's mentioned later on in the leaks. So um, I think a lot of the the posturing and, and BS that, and uh, misinformation, I think, I think it, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Star Wars, uh, Disney Star Wars would put out misinformation. All right. I just think, especially with this leak out there, uh, I, th I mean, the government would do this. So the government has admitted to doing this. Uh, they had uh, on a show called Unidentified, they had interviewed a former government agent who uh, noticed a guy had been uh, he had a ham radio and and he had been broadcasting seeing lights in New Mexico. And what he was seeing was experimental aircraft in New Mexico. So the government caught wind of this and listen to what they did to this guy. They started sending him information that it was UFOs and the aliens were coming down and they started making up like an alien coded message just to make this guy think he was seeing aliens instead of secret government craft. Uh, and this one guy was tasked to do this and they effed with this guy. They would, they would uh, bring him uh, to the base and they would meet with him. They completely screwed with this guy's head just for national security. So... I'm not saying Disney would go to those lengths, but I could certainly, I would certainly believe that Disney might put false spoilers out there to get people distracted from these Reddit leaks, which could be spot on. They might not be. We'll find out. But you know what? We're fans. We can talk about whatever the hell we want. Uh, so let's let's get to what you guys are saying. Uh, but I think I certainly think there was some misinformation put out there because of this, uh, and honestly. They had to know the leaks are out there and that, that I don't know if the blade image came from a TV spot. I don't know where it came from, but, uh, they should have, you, know, you might want to like leave that out. Uh, maybe that's why the trailers have been so nothing. Uh, always remember that, uh, Jihadi Jarbo runs Kiwi farms and is a, as a ist, uh, says was uh, W Z R B S. Thank you for the $5. I will remember that. Um, I am aware of that site, uh, I, but I don't go there. I don't go there. I'm not, uh, I listen, uh, no judgment here. I am not into internet drama. Uh, I, I know it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's entertaining to watch. I just don't want to partake in any of it, <laughs> but, uh, I, hey, if somebody wants to do it, that's great. That's, I, you know. Again, I, I'm not going to tell people what to do with their channels. Uh, it's not for me to judge what people do to their channels. And, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of that going around. You don't need me adding to it. Uh, Professor Thaskalis for $5. The Master. The new Disney ride at Star Wars is already broken down and a number of times too funny. And, yes, that was the issue they were having with it. I don't know how much I can say. Uh, because I was actually talking to somebody privately about this. Uh, and it was somebody who did me a favor. I don't want to get them in trouble. Um, but I think it's out there that they were having a lot of technical issues with the ride because the ride is based on wireless technology. And I think they're going to continue having that trouble. I don't think it's something they're going to be able to solve. Uh, but you know, I think that they just went, they put so much into this galaxy's edge and you could see why they, now that you see the Mandalorian, uh, I understand a little bit why they went that direction. It's still a horrible, it was still a stupid decision as hell. You can make a Star Wars land that ha it, that implements all Star Wars. But Bob Iger didn't want that. Apparently, according to Bob Iger, he saw some test footage from freaking Solo and decided to go turn Galaxy's Edge to what it is. Solo. Bob Iger is probably not, uh, he's probably a little biased when it comes to watching uh, his baby. Cause like he sees star Wars as his legacy. See Bob Iger's legacy is buying stuff. He hasn't really done anything on his own. He's, 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 uh, you know, he's climbed his way up the ladder. He's become, I'm talking about creatively. I'm not talking about business. Of course, the man rose up from a weatherman and became a CEO of the biggest company. That's a huge accomplishment, but I'm talking about creative legacy. And that's, this probably bothers him because he runs the, the biggest creative company of all time. 
and he is surrounded by artists and creatives and he's just a banker, dude. He's a weatherman. He's a banker. So he wanted a creative legacy. So he just bought a bunch, uh, but he didn't create any. And that probably bothers him. Uh, the thing is with narcissists and egomaniacs, uh, they, they always want what they can't have. B.B. Uh, Meyer for 25 rubles, 25 rons. We're just going to call it. It says R-O-N for the monetary. Thank you, B.B. Uh, wanted to throw some money at you. May as well say I saw some Star Wars toys in Europe, including Baby Yoda figurine. You saw one. So they have them out already. Well, that's good. That's smart. That'll be the biggest selling toy this year. Uh, hopefully they make them, you know, with some quality. The quality of toys has gone down so bad. Uh, that's part of the problem. Michael M for, thank you, BB. I appreciate it. Uh, Michael M for two Canadian pesos. Love your channel. Michael M. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, th we've, we've experienced amazing growth and, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm very grateful for you and everybody here, everybody in the chat. Uh, it, I'm having the time of my life. This is so much damn fun. It sucks that Star Wars sucks. It stuck, sucks that Star Trek and Doctor Who have fallen apart. But honestly, I saw a guy make a comment. Somebody was going after Jeremy again and the fandom menace. And somebody said the nicest comment. And it was a normie. It probably wasn't a fandom menace member. He came in and it was on Twitter and they just said, listen, these people made lemon out of lemonades. They, they were really into these their shows and their and their movies and they feel like these things turned on them so they found each other and yeah we talk some shit uh but it's really just like friends talking shit uh people love to focus on the uber ne negative stuff that really isn't part of the fandom menace that of course there's people on twitter and instagram who are awful and they're they're doing it for the lulls that's it they're anonymous they aren't really uh active members of the fandom menace. Sure, there's bad apples. There's bad apples everywhere. But they love to take those people and uh, and besmirch the fandom menace, especially the Kelly Marie Tran thing. The fandom menace, as far as I know, doesn't have this huge presence on Instagram. Uh, I'm sure there's members over there. They partake in it, but I don't know. I, I just don't see it. Uh, fandom menace is primarily on Twitter. And again, like I said in my video, it has the most impact on YouTube. Second most searched thing on the planet, but thank you. But I love what that guy said. It's just, we, that's all we're doing. We're just trying to make lemons out of lemonade. And you know what? Later on, I'm going to talk about something that's better, that that's good, that you can watch. And it comes out in a few days. Thank you, Michael. Some nobody for $2. Uh, Uche, I'm still in the movie. Ah, smash. I love Uche. He's awesome. Um, Orville Nation for $5. You said it so correctly, Gary. Wow. I like to hear that. Can I read that again? You said it so correctly, Gary. I don't hear that often. That's why. Uh, JJ uses one-liners for character building, which is why so many characters feel hollow. Yes. I mean, I was read. I, I got to isolate it because he was trying to defend that. He was all, but we did characterize it. Uh, so, of course, we know there's going to be an LGBTQ plus character in Star Wars, and that's very important to a lot of people. And guess what? Guess what it's going to be? I, I don't know who it's going to be, but JJ has promised it. And it's going to be somebody walking on screen and they put their arm around somebody and go, I'm LGBTQ plus, And that's it. That's it. So if that makes you feel represented, represented on screen, uh, okay, fine. Uh, I don't... It, you know, there is a way to write that into the story and make it good. And if, and if they and listen and it's proof that they don't believe it. So to our LGBTQ plus friends out there and we have them, I've got them. Uh, that's called superficial. They don't really care. Uh, but believe me, I uh, Jeremy brought this up in his video and I agree with him 100 percent. The reason they put it in there. Do you think it was for representation or do you think it was for critic proof? I'll say both. I'll say both uh, that and we're going to get into Star Trek casting. And I think Alex, uh, Al Alex Kurtzman said too much. He said too much. John F. Trent caught it uh, over at Bounding into Comics and a lot of other people caught it too. And we'll get into that in about yeah, 20 minutes or so. Congrats on the join button. I already used it. Uh, uh, TG Fubuck for $2. Thank you. And I appreciate it. And um, I've got to hit up Josiah today. 
about emojis. And uh, Josiah from uh, Josiah Rises, please subscribe to Young Josiah. He's a good kid. Um, he's a good man. I'm sorry. I don't mean to kid. I'm just old. That's all. Uh, he offered to help me. So thank you. Uh, I'll send him some cheddar. Maybe he can buy a new computer. A sum, nobody for $2. Uche, I'm much lower energy about fixing my ship. <laughs> uh, John, thank you for the $2. John Matrix for $5. So Ray is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, healing the sick and raising the dead. No thanks. Hell seems perfectly fine for me. Agreed, John. I'll see you there, buddy. I got an e-ticket. I got an e-ticket. <clears throat> so, yeah, Ray's force healing powers, I think really confirms uh, uh, my internet son, Ryan, at RK Outpost, his theory. Uh, I am i don't know if it's his theory or not, but I, this is where I heard it first. And he's, when he was reviewing The Mandalorian, he noticed uh, that Baby Yoda was a bit amped up and they were going to use this as an excuse to explain Ray, uh, Ray's Force powers. And I completely agree with this theory at this point. Um uh, force healing makes sense, uh, and I'm trying to think if I remember reading it in a comic. I don't, but it could have happened. It could. I'm sure it happened in the EU. I think the EU has pretty much gone over everything, uh, but you know I haven't read every book. Uh, Fourteen barber for two pounds, buzzing to not see this. JJ kills all good things. He is the cinematic antichrist, as appropriately named by our Lord and Savior, Savior Doomcock. Uh, sip of Pete's for the working man and woman. <clears throat> ah, <clears throat> excuse me. NJ Scoundrel for $5. On a recent South Park, a new girl has a huge interest in the Mandalorian saying, best thing since Empire makes all the new movies look like dog shite. Th really? <laughs> I have to say I agree with the young lady from South Park. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you, NJ Scr Scoundrel, for the five dollars. Uh, Wizard BS, uh, is it Wizard BS for ten dollars? Just having a little fun with you. Thanks for everything you do, brother. Oh, of course, of course. Um, and, and and hey, Epstein didn't kill himself. So right back at you, buddy. Thank you very much, and welcome to the Jaloja level. I appreciate you. Uh, what's up, Mike S. Miller? How you doing? How's San Diego? I miss San Diego, man. Uh, Mike S. Miller has uh, joined the proto-molecule level, and I appreciate that. Uh, what's Oh, there he is right there. Of course they didn't uh, They did it in the EU, Gary, but that's not a source material, right? No, of course not, because uh, that didn't exist, Ryan. That source material didn't resist. And everybody, there's Ryan right there. Uh, let me... Oh, I can't... Why can't I go to channel from here? That's weird. All right. Um, RK Outpost. Uh, according to Christy... Oh, she put in Josiah Rises. Could you put in um, Ryan's too? I'm sure you're already well ahead of me on that. According to Christy, uh, everybody give it up to According to Christy, one of my best mods. We got Mark Rosath and we got Chris Persia. But I love you guys. And Matthew Matson and Hale Doomcock, of course. Uh, Graham Mc McIntosh for 10 Canadian pesos. There's two prop bets out there for Mando on sports books right now. Do you think the Mando will show his face in season one? Do you think the baby Yoda will use the force again in season one? Uh, thoughts on each. Um, the Mando will not show his face in season one. Uh, I take that back. At the end. Mm. The baby Yoda will use the force again for sure. The Mando will show his face at the end of season one. Yes. I think at the very end, he'll show his face to the baby. And that will uh, be showing that the, the baby is a family member now. Like they have a connection. I mean, they, it's already there. Listen, this show is extremely predictable. And any twist that we get will be just withheld information. Um, so there's different types of twists. There's ones you foreshadow. There's flipping a character, uh, but that requires characterization. Uh, they went back to basics with the show, and believe me, this is a very good thing. It was a smart, smart move. You give it to John Favreau, and you tell him, will you make an Iron Man Star Wars? Just make me an Iron Man Star Wars, and that's what they did. 
Uh, I don't need uh, I don't need any deep plot. I don't need major sophistication. I need a likable character and a show with heart. I don't care if it's predictable. I, I, I don't care. Just we need to make something that doesn't alienate fans. And they did it. So far, they've done it. Is there, I mean, is there little moments uh, that uh, seem woke? Yes, it's Disney Star Wars and they deserve this criticism. And I'm not going to criticize anybody who brings it up because Disney has earned that. They need to earn our trust back. And this is a good step in the right direction. Uh, it, I, they'll never get me back. But uh, maybe they'll get some of you back. And that's cool. That's that's great. I want You know what? I want you guys to be happy. I want you guys to be happy. I do. Um, Professor Thaskalos for $5. Billy D. Williams took the media to task uh, about not even knowing what gender fluidity is. And the Lando is just a straight guy. And he was misquoted. Uh, he was. I'll have to look into that. I saw that uh, Billy D. Williams took the media to task about not even knowing what gender fluidity fluidity is, and that Lando is just a straight guy, and he was misquoted. Gotcha. And we we can go over that. Thank you, uh, Professor Thaskalos. Mongoose McQueen has become a member of the proto proto molecule level. Thank you very much. And some nobody for two dollars. Yeah, I wonder which authors they're ripping off now. Uh, well, we have to see. Uh. Oh, that's the reason they got rid of the EU was to avoid any IP litigation. That's the reason they got rid of the EU. That um, I, I think I'm a hundred percent right on that because we don't know the structure of the George Lucas contract. And we don't know if George Lucas had prior deals with other authors about owning certain content. And those deals have to be honored through the purchase of an organization unless that is written out. Uh, the Viacom CBS merger has to honor the Alex Kurtzman, uh, any kind of third party contract. They have to honor that stuff. Uh, and that's part of governments allowing mergers to happen. I know I don't have in-depth knowledge. I just, uh, I've taken on a partner before in my business and I know I've had deals with other people and I had to import them into, uh, when we became a, a corporation and yeah, <clears throat> it's all businessy. Uh, it's the stuff I hate. I just honestly, I just want to create. That's all I want to do. Uh, Benjamin Fleshborg for 200 Danish crones. Always great stuff from you. That is, uh, thank you. Uh, that is good to hear. I'm glad I'm still uh, keeping it up. I will do my very best. I am not perfect. And, I, and you guys know that. I'm not punctual. I'm not perfect. I'm very flawed. Uh, but yet, uh, I'm happy. I'm happy. Finally, caught a nooner. Grats on 178,000 subs. Gary says the Canadian Highlander for two Canadian pesos. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I just passed 178,000. And then YouTube's going to take 1,000 from me uh, in the next couple of days. But I'm grateful for all I have. And thank you, everybody, for joining up. And please, over the next few days, if you could keep an eye on that bell for me and, and all of your favorite YouTubers. YouTube is uh, doing their old account scrub where they get rid of old accounts and bots. They just did one a couple of months ago. I don't know why they're doing another one right before the end of the year. Or wait a minute. Yes, I do. Copa. The Copa Cabana is happening this year. And while I think I might be safe, I, I'm not sure, but the channels are going to disappear come the first. And it's going to be a giant apocalypse. It's going to be a giant S show. That's why I'm working on plan B. Uh, I have a GoFundMe for my shop, uh, but I'm going to be adding to something to it so I can, uh, uh, people who donate over a certain amount, you're going to get something. Uh, I'm uh, Tug gave me this idea, so hail Tug, hail that umbrella guy. I'm going to find an artist to make, uh, to make a print that this artist will sign. I'm going to try to find a big time artist. Maybe I can get my friend Derek to do something. I know he's super busy with this TV show, Derek Robertson from The Boys, uh, or maybe... I don't know, commission John Byrne or something. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I was thinking I would love to have like a John Byrne Gandalf or a Derek Robertson Gandalf uh, and have him sign it and make a print out of it. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, AKA Blonded for $5. Hey, Gary, two days in a row. Teddy, uh, my 
Pomeranian ate Yoda he did. Oh no, some time ago. He can't wait for baby Yoda. Oh, I bet you he's going to taste good. <laughs> hey, remember, oh, what's what was the name of that toy that was really popular in the early aughts that reacted to you, that you, you would talk to and it, would, it was a learning toy and they, they made a Yoda version of that. And I had that in my office forever and it broke finally, but it was a Yoda who would talk to me and you can answer, it would answer questions. What was the name? But it was based on another toy and I can't remember. Is that, I, yeah. So what happened to that is, uh, my, my other dog, Mandy, who I miss Mandy Pat. Oh, whew. I can't talk about Mandy. Mandy was uh, a stray that I found. She was a Rottweiler. She had a bunch of puppies. I found her on the side of the road when I was uh, parts delivering back in the 90s. And I piled her into my truck. I almost got fired from my job. I didn't care. I stood up to my boss. I said, I'm not going to let... I found these dogs on the freeway, on the freeway medium. It was a mother and three puppies. And I swung in the medium and I threw them in the back of my truck. I took them to my work. My boss yelled at me. Uh, and I found homes for all these dogs, and I kept Mandy. Uh, she passed away, unfortunately. She was a great dog, but she ate my my Yoda. She ate my Yoda. I was I was, I, but I couldn't get mad at her. I couldn't. Uh, the Midnight Garner for two dollars. Captain America played by, uh, by RuPaul. Oh, that's next. That's next. RuPaul is Captain America. Yes, she's gonna have a dance off with uh, the Red Skull. Uh, zero killer for sixteen twenty eight five dollars. Do you think there's any chance Dave Filoni will take over from Kathleen Kennedy? Yes, in a way. Uh, he seems to be the one uh, of the few who knows how to write Star Wars. I think John Favreau and Dave Filoni will be the architects of what's going to be an MCU type Star Wars, and that would be smart. I don't think you can get Kevin Feige, but what you do is you follow, follow that very successful business model. Uh, and you, what you do is you bring in people who love the work. See, Disney could not have created the MCU, and they didn't create the MCU. And, and Kevin Feige was part of it, but it was the Paramount deal. It was desperation, and it was also passion. You got a bunch of creatives together, and it wasn't about money. It was about, hey, let's do this really fun, cool thing with the MCU and see if we can get away with it. And of course, it became about money once it got successful, but it didn't belong to Disney until the Avengers. And Disney could have never created something like this. Star, There will never be another Star Wars, just like there'll never be another Beatles. The structure of entertainment now is too corporate, and nothing like that will ever happen again. Uh, you'll, you'll, get, you'll still get good stuff. But we're not going to get a Star Wars unless somebody independently wealthy is independently creative and can do it all on its own, all on his or her own. Uh, Father Christopher Miller for two dollars. Copa, 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 oh, Copa, 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 Copa. Co oh, fuck, I just fucked that up. Copa Chameleon. Uh, that's why I don't sing. That's why I don't sing. I only sing at band practice when our singer didn't show up. Uh, the Oracle of $5, proud member of the fandom menace. Hail! The Oracle created a Christmas album video on YouTube this year. The Oracle's Eve. Please let Mrs. Nerdrotic know. I will. Thank you, The Oracle. You are The Oracle. They cut you out of the movie. That's messed up. Echo Watt for $5. Hey, Gary. Been with you since the last Jedi review. Whoa! Yes, you have, Echo Watt. Uh, how many subs did I have with the last Jedi review? That was 2018. Uh, I had, that was before I hit a thousand echo watt. Uh, I appreciate you for keeping it real. Stay, stay blessed. And Epstein didn't kill himself. Echo watt bless you. Thank you for being, uh, being with me since I was a beardless boy in my last Jedi review, debating, debating my good friend, uh, who I love dearly. Uh, we haven't talked a long time, but John Reed is one of my best friends. I love the guy. Uh, and he liked the movie. And I did not. And we kept it civil because I've known him for years. Uh, but I believe I called it an abomination over and over again back then. And I promised never to talk about it again. And I didn't for a year, over a year. Uh, my, I, You know what? Uh, after that, after The Last Jedi, my first Star Wars video was this April. I think I made it in April, April or May. My first Star Wars video. 
Uh, Echo Watt, thank you again. Some nobody for two dollars. Get my boy Mike S. Miller to do a print for you. Um, oh, dude, I'm sorry, Mike. That, that's actually a pretty fucking good idea. <laughs> hey, um, does anybody anybody know a good colorist? I need a solid, solid colorist. There used to be a picture hanging up back there. It's not there anymore. Is it around here? Can I find it? No, it's not around here. It's it's in my closet. So it's the uh, the girl that's on my banner is called Cosmic Crater Girl. She was created by my wife, Melissa, Mrs. Nerd Roddick. And uh, I, we drew up a whole character chart for her. So I created, uh, I, I wrote up like her backstory. Melissa created her back in the 80s. And Derek Robertson drew a, drew a picture of her for us during a, a birthday dinner. And he did a, a whole print for me for a birthday present for the comic outpost. And it's her sitting down reading a comic book. Uh, all I have is a black and white version of that. I've always wanted it to get it professionally co colored. Maybe we can make that the print too. Oh, uh, golly. I don't know if I have a picture of it. Uh, I could show you guys later. Uh, bu -bu -bum. Captain Robert April, I hope you're feeling better. I know you got in a car accident, so um, bless you, man. Glad you're still around. Baby Yoda is the way, the truth, and the light. No man can come to true Star Wars but through him, says Captain Robert April. Bless you. That is the way I have spoken. Casey Osowski for $5. Not even Ray can heal her own movie. <laughs> As always, glad to hear. Did you get my email? Yes, I will respond. Uh, Felipe Abrigo for 2,500 uh, Chilean dollars. Hey, Gary, Kathleen Kennedy's initials are KK. In Spanish, that reads caca or just caca. As you live in Poop City, you know what I mean. Caca. And I also, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some nobody for $2. It'll get less expensive to be creative, hopefully. As time goes on, yes. Uh, I was able to make an Exozone intro uh, with green screen that back in 2011, it would have taken me an hour to do this thing. And I did it in five minutes, five minutes. And you guys will see it on the next Exozone. It's got UFOs flying over San Francisco and Austin. Uh, and then they phase into an alien. And yeah, I made it in five minutes. So it's a lot easier but you're competing against the billion dollar companies. Um, so some people, and, and listen, I don't have a problem with this. So there have been some people out there in the fandom menace asking what's next, what's next. And, uh, I will preface this by saying we're still in the heat of the battle. We, we, we've won a couple of skirmishes. We've won a couple of battles, but this thing is raging on and it, it's not just star Wars. Uh, the, we got the MCU coming. We got Star Trek Picard coming on the 23rd. We got Star Trek Discovery coming at the end of the year. We got Doctor Who coming on January 1st. Uh, I'm a nerd. I enjoy all this stuff. I'm not just a Star Wars nerd. I'm not just a Star Wars channel. I'm not just a Doctor Who's channel. I'm, I like I like it all. I like DC, Marvel, Lord of the Rings. I like it all. The only thing I don't like is because, and it's not like I don't like it. I'm just not into it. It's video games because I'm too busy reading comics and doing all that other shit. Uh, but no, this is far from over, but what's next? Well, whatever you want to be next, because the fandom menace is not an organization. It's not something that can be made for profit. Our strength is in our numbers. So if you're trying to start your own movement for one, if, especially if it's related to star Wars way too late, you might as well join the fandom menace and you can, your guess what? Your opinions don't have to change. Uh, there are no dues or fees. You can like The Last Jedi and not like the direction Disney's going in and still come on over here to The Phantom Menace and you will just be another voice. Our strength is in our numbers. If we start, uh, if we start, and listen, a certain amount of gatekeeping, I can't, I mean, I don't think you're a real Phantom Menace member if you're all about Disney and you don't care, you, you're, I mean, yeah, that's not really Phantom Menace. Phantom Menace is... We want politics out of Star Wars. We want respect for the fan, respect for the paying customer. That's it. Uh, none of us are ists or phobes, and we want that to stop. That needs to stop. And it looks to me like the access media is doing their best to stop that, but they can't. They're just incapable of it because they're dying and they're desperate. 
But if you want to break away and make your own thing, do it. You can still be Phantom Menace and create your own stuff. But to try to make a separate group that breaks away from the Phantom Menace, that is just creating another click. You're just creating a click. Uh, now, you could have a group of friends that you hang out with that you would really enjoy spending their time with and helping each other out. That's cool. You can even name yourself. But if you're trying to separate from this, well, then you're just separating. That's all it is. Strength in numbers. You got to keep it, uh, you know, undefined. The fandom menace has to be undefined. The minute it gets defined, the minute it becomes an organization, the minute it has a leader, uh, that's the that's the minute it's over. Uh, because then you can be just shoved aside and then, you know, people will feel like they don't belong and they'll start leaving and then the numbers shrink and then you lose your power because the power was in the numbers. That's my thoughts on it. That's the, and, and I don't, you know, the, again, I think they're right, but I could be wrong. I could be. Uh, so if we want to create our own stuff, certainly, but it's not like comics gate. Okay. Comics gate can fund comics that can be superior to what Marvel and DC are putting out. But here's the problem. It's also quantity. Marvel and DC can pump out tons of crap every week. Uh, and even if they have a diamond in the rough, they're still just destroying the market in quantity. And the comic industry is dying because of this. And that's why the comics gate was created. That's why they branched off. That's why they started creating their stuff because they recognized that they weren't going to change DC and Marvel. And there's a point where you have to do that, where you have to go. It's not going to change for one. I don't think we're at that point with entertainment. Not yet. And it depends on each individual franchise. For me, I walked, I did walk away from star Wars. I'm not trying to change anything. I'm just giving you my opinion. Uh, if something changes, great. Uh, but, and you know what it did and I had nothing to do with it. Uh, the reason we have the Mandalorian, that is change. That is change. Uh, so that is a victory. <clears throat> the comic industry decided to double down and then people just said, F it. Okay. I'm out. And some drama happened too. That doesn't help either, but, uh, that's, that's it's human nature. It's human nature. Uh, the Dr. 14 Blu-ray reviews for 10 pounds. You would have hated the soccer I watched tonight. It was woke, stupid rainbow laces to make the LGBTQ uh, plus people welcome at matches. Let's boycott soccer as well. Uh, I wouldn't want to boycott soccer for having rainbow uh, shoelaces. That, that doesn't bother me. I, you know what? That, I, I never liked the pink uh, in football either except for the pink Raider helmet, because I would always show that to the Raider fans, uh, which was funny. Um, but no, I, listen, that's woke. It is. Uh, but I wouldn't want to boycott the sport over that. Um, see, the thing is, you have to decipher, and I, I get I get what you're saying, Doctor, and I know you've been around here a long time, but you got to decipher the community from the political organization, uh, because they're two different things. I hate the word community, the individual LGBTQ plus people who are just people, uh, we're not talking about them, but the political organization that has a political goal, uh, I can have a problem with that. And that doesn't mean I don't like gay people, uh, but that's not what they'll tell you. And that's where those things get conflated, right? There's individual person make an individual decision, which I am all about. I am absolutely all about sleep with who you want, marry who you want. I don't care as long as you're not breaking the law, hurting anybody or messing with any kids. I'm fine. It doesn't bother me. Never has. So, uh, and, and you're welcome here. I mean, cause people are people, but the political organization, uh, which has been, uh, mobilizing, uh, that's a bit of a problem because it, it's, it stopped just looking out for for their, uh, the individuals. It only looks out for the individuals who agree with them politically. Well, that's, that's a political organization. Then you're not an organization that's looking out. Uh, cause you know, there was a time they had, there was a time they were persecuted. Uh, they were getting beaten up and killed and they had to, you know, strengthen numbers. 
Uh, but now it's turned into a political movement, and yeah, that sucks. And it gets into our entertainment, and it is uh, it is part of the problem in Hollywood right now. Uh, hey, Gary, is there any chance Redstone will fire Kurtzman or work around the ch- uh, the dunces like Disney is doing with The Mandalorian? Live long and prosper, Gary, says Robert Johnson for four ninety nine. Yes, I I don't know. I don't know. I had been hearing from... Uh, my insider for a long time that that was going to be the case, but I don't think that's the case anymore. And that's just based on my opinion. Uh, they have a contract in place. They have millions of dollars invested in these star Trek shows. This is it. This is why you're, this is what you're getting. This is what you're getting. Sorry. So, um, my only hope is Michael Shaban somehow worked around Kurtzman, just like the Mandalorian, like you said, and we get a decent Picard show. And I'm telling you, I would accept a mediocre Picard show. I would love it if they just gave us Star Trek that wasn't filled with the really, the horribly cringe Alex Kurtzman politics in his Star Trek. I just don't think that's going to be avoided. Uh, the problem is you have uh, Hollywood elitists, like minded Hollywood elitists, all basically. I'm sorry, it's a giant circle jerk. So anybody, uh, Walter Mosley was too conservative for them. And that's why they sent him packing from Star Trek Discovery. So I think the chances of Picard being good are slim, but it's a possibility and I would love for it to happen. I don't think Redstone's going to fire Kurtzman, no. Uh, I think the con- the contract is in place, but they've already been trying to work around him. They've already given him co-show runners and they had Michael Chabon run the show instead of Alex Kurtzman. So you could tell they're not entirely happy. There's no way they're happy with the, a, a, a small divided fandom because... Everything is writing on Star Trek for CBS All Access, which means it's done. It's a trap productions for $5. I know a great colorist. Can I DM uh, you their contact info on Twitter or email? Uh, do it via email, Gary at nerdrotic.com. Please email it to me. Yes. If they could whip up this page for me, I'd be very happy. Uh, Loquacious Primate for $2. Sending some prelim web device ad- advice. Check your email. Thank you, Loquacious Primate. I appreciate that. I'm building a, a real website, and uh, he's going to help me. I met him in New York. Great guy. Smart. Brilliant. Went to NYU. Smart. Uh, Baptist 702. Not all those university kids are bad. Uh, Baptist 702 for $5. Can you give a brief comment on the DC Rebirth Superman series? Also, are you doing Google Hangouts with Gandalf-level subscribers? Um, I can. Baptist, I can. I was going to do a review of the first chapter for you guys, but we can uh, we can just do a hangout. That'd be all right. Uh, oh, you mean on membership? I'm sorry, I was thinking Patreon. Yes, uh, I will be doing one uh, this weekend. I will keep an eye on the community section. Okay, so I'll contact you guys via the community section, and we'll do a Google Hangout. Um, DC Rebirth, Superman, great series. It is. It's one of my, it's my third favorite Superman story ever. Uh, I remember when it came out at the comic shop, I was singing its praises. Yes, it's Mark Wade. Mark Wade has written some great stuff. He's a dick. He's a total dick. Uh, I would never sell his stuff again, but I'm not going to deny that he was a great writer at one time and had one hell of a run. Uh, actually, in the mid aughts, he was on fire. He was writing some of the best stuff out there. He wrote uh, Irredeemable which was excellent uh, rebirth, but he also tried to keep uh, Richard Meyer from uh, getting his comic book about uh, a GI Joe, a bunch of GI Joe guys uh, saving a giant gorilla uh, into comic stores. Uh, And I think that, uh, you know, a professional doing that, you want to talk about, I hate the term, but bullying, that's what it was. Uh, Mark Wade has got problems. Uh, You can tell the guy's like bipolar or something. I don't know. Uh, I've seen him at a lot of cons. I've seen his act. I've seen him interact with people. And it, uh, I would not call that uh, mature. I wouldn't call it mature. Kai MFS for $5. I know a crap ton of artists and I am one. If you need an art colorist for anything. Uh, okay. Uh, email me, Gary at nerdrotic.com. 
I knew I'd find some guys there. Uh, when I was in London for Bjork's concert last month, oh, Mrs. Nerdrotic would be very happy. She loves Bjork. Uh, I randomly met a member of the Fandom Menace from Northern California in a pub. Our strength is in our numbers. It is. That is crazy. I love that. Uh, Mrs. Nerdrotic loves Bjork so much that she went to Iceland by herself uh, to go uh, be at one with her Bjorkness. Uh, the funniest thing at Coachella, Bjork played at Coachella one year. And this was when Coachella was tra- transitioning from being like a, a punk uh, show to, you know, like pop and hip hop and stuff. And it turned bad. But Bjork played there one year and uh, all the little boys from uh, the West Hollywood in San Francisco came out into the middle of the desert with their with their makeup on and their fairy wings and stuff. And they were passing out by the dozens. It was so funny. Uh, we were having to crowd surf all these little boys uh, who were passing out from the heat. <laughs> we're just laughing. Uh, John J M28 for 10 pounds. They were fine, I'm sure. Uh, what about ye, ye Gary? Quickly, do you dislike the cast of Disney Star Wars? Belfast uh, hates woke Kathleen Kennedy, etc. Star Trek destroyed, destroyed with trans crew for fuck's sake. Uh, keep her lit and get up, uh, get up those stars, big fella. Tap top drawer. Well, top drawer. Well, thank you. I can read, John. Um, do I dislike the cast of Disney Star Wars as far as the Rise of Skywalker? I've got no problem with uh, Oscar Isaac, uh, Jonathan Boyega. I think he's, I think he likes to have fun with people on social media, so that doesn't bother me. Now, I try not to get involved. Uh, Daisy Ridley recently said something pretty stupid in GQ, which I will p- probably point out in my next video, or at least on Friday Night Tights. Uh, Anna did a video on it. You can go check it out. But yeah, let's get back to the leaks real quick, and then we'll get to the Vanity Fair interview uh welcome we have uh 2200 plus watching we have 684 likes thank you for joining Uh, i appreciate you all uh and we've yeah we've got time i'm i'm chilling like i said i'm not making a video today so we've got time let's get back and we'll just finish out the leaks we'll do this for a few more minutes and then we'll get to the star trek thing uh boom there we go where were we uh, Zori and Poe, Zor- Zori Bliss, uh, reminisce about old times sometime around or during the 3PO sequence. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a scene of Zori Bliss beating the shit out of Poe. I'm guessing there is because this is Disney Star Wars. Uh, she's uh, Boba Femme, Boba Femme. Uh, I'm told that there is some lingering connection there, even though they had some sort of falling out in the past, Poe tries to convince Zori to join them. She turns him down, but she understands the good in what Poe is trying to do and gives him a First Order captain's medallion as a gesture of goodwill to help them go through First Order security. She had been saving uh, to buy this medallion on the black market as her ticket off Kajimi and away from her spice running days, but she gives it to Poe. Kylo... Krylo's Star Destroyer arrives at the planet and Ray senses that Chewbacca is still alive. This is the motivation for our crew to go up to Krylo's ship, not retrieving the Falcon. Krylo spends much of the time antagonizing Ray, and we've already talked about that. Ray finds and grabs Uchi's dagger, but when she does, it gives her visions of what happened to her parents. Uchi found and killed them with the dagger, and her parents were trying to hide her from Uchi. When she breaks free of the vision, a bond of Krylo begins. Back on the surface of the planet and having grown tired of the fruitless search for Rey, Kylo initiates another force bond with her. He discovers that she is on a Star Destroyer and has a lightsaber duel breaks out between the two of them across different locations. Kylo on the surface and Kamiji and Rey aboard the Star Destroyer. During this encounter, Kylo reveals that there is more to the story behind Rey's parents. Uchi was sent to find and recover Rey, not kill her. Her parents just got in the way. She is still wanted for the darkness that resides in her. Mm. The darkness that resides in Ray. I'm so convinced of that. D- Daisy, Daisy Ridley can be so... That, that sweet, uh, cute little girl can be so dark and intimidating. And this is the funny thing that's been happening in Hollywood. 
There are women who are intimidating. There are women who can be very charismatic. It is a human thing. It's not a male thing or a female thing. But when you when you cast little cutesy pie actresses and then you want them to be feared. Um, it, it, I'm sorry. It's not I, I, Daisy Ridley. Um, wouldn't scare a fly. I'm sorry. She's 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 cute. She's adorable. Uh, her head is about as round as Ryan's, but uh, no, she's fine. She's fine. Um, yeah, I the badass is not what I I you know I don't see. Um, you know what? Uh, I didn't like the movie at all, but uh, Justin Bieber in Terminator Dark Fate, she was pretty badass. She was. She she yoked herself out. Uh, Mackenzie Davis. She she got to work. She, I mean, like, listen. I know why they did it. They they really wanted to make her look like a boy, but it, uh, it fit into the story. It did. Uh, it's the only thing that did fit in that crap movie. And honestly, you got to ask yourself why didn't Brie Larson do that for Captain Marvel? Why didn't Ray do that uh, for maybe not the first movie, but for the third movie? Um, you know, Mark Hamill worked out. Mark Hamill was all soft and everything. He worked out later. Uh, yeah, you know, whatever. God, if Star Wars were made today, people would be shipping Luke and Han. Or no, Lando and Han. It'd be uh, it'd be a uh, Hondo. It'd be Hondo. Or were they doing that in Solo too? Probably. I kind of want to give these people ideas. Apparently, it's now Pride who delivers the fatal blow to Hux, not Kylo. During the period, he tells Kylo that he, even though he didn't have the dagger, he knows where the resistance is going because they scanned it while it was still in their possession. I'm told that Ray escapes by just barely jumping onto the Falcon while it's on the edge of a hangar, and we've seen that scene in a trailer. So Hux gets killed by General Pride. Uh, Finn and Jana apparently chase after Ray. To and the through the Darth Star, oh, so we got the Death Star wreckage. Uh, this is where Ray defeats Kylo and kills him, uh, or or mortally wounds him and then heals him. Uh, evidently, Luke's appearance to Leia before her death has been cut out. I'm told that there was just a voiceover, so it wasn't difficult to do. But it's gone at this moment. At all all the same. Although there doesn't seem to be any sign of Luke during Leia's death, I'm told that R2 is with her in the final moments. Oh my god. The scene of Rey and Kylo's fight on the Death Star are cut back and forth with Leia's death. I'm told that Palpatine senses her death too, making him more confident that Rey... Uh, and, and listen, Palpatine's the last one standing. Han, Luke, Leia, all dead, Palpatine still alive. I want you to let that sink in a little bit. Let it sink in a little bit. Fuck you, JJ Abrams. Fuck you. Oh. I'm told Palpatine senses her death to making him more confident that Ray uh, now has nobody to turn but him. And the last one standing is Ray because she's the bestest ever. And you say, and and that rumor I reported that Jar Jar and Rian were tasked to kill the original cast, if this is true, has come to fruition. They have done their job. Uh, sometime around here, Palpatine orders Kajimi to be destroyed as the first ships of the Sith fleet reach deploy, uh, deployment altitude. I mean, they couldn't just simply had them be in the background in the story. They, they, they believe so little in their character, Ray. They had to kill the main characters. They had to kill them all to make her special. And they don't believe that she could be special without it. You know, you could have done that if you were talented. Uh, notes, I'm being told Ray's interactions with Luke have been completely reshot. My knowledge on the specifics are sparse are sparse at best, but I'm told that the overall message and tone remains the same. Following her experience on the Death Star, Rey returns to the island of Achu. Uh, th throughout the course of the film, she has been given giving into her aggression. She nearly kills her friend by unleashing a stream of lightning on a ship. Learn that she is the descendant of a Sith Lord reduced to Jedi who were 
Jews who reduced the Jedi in numbers and they have yet to recover from it half a century later saw a vision of herself as a servant of darkness and stabbed her enemy through the chest in anger. Her most recent account with Kylo was the last straw and Rey has now made the decision to follow the example set by Luke and quit. So that's the only inspiration Rey can get from a man is to quit and exile herself on the island where the Jedi began. Rey scuttles the ship. She stole from Kylo and throws the repaired lightsaber originally constructed by Anakin Skywalker in after it. The ghost hand of Luke appears to Rey holding the weapon. So ghost hands can admit lightning and hold weapons. Then where the F are you guys? Where are you guys? If you could do this stuff, uh, the Jedi should have been able to win. Holding the weapon she just discarded, Luke, Luke's conversation with Rey is said to be encouraging yet realistically grim in tone. Luke knows that Luke knows firsthand what it's like to face Palpatine. Well, Luke Luke knows only hand because he's only got one hand, <laughs> and that's not an easy task. But Ray can do it because she's better than she's better than Luke. Ray must confront Palpatine in the same way that Luke once had to confront Vader. Luke encourages Ray by telling her that the faith Leia had in her. Oh my God. Ray must confront Palpatine in the same way that Luke once had to confront Vader. Luke encourager, Luke encourages her by telling her the faith that Leia had in her. <laughs> Leia, who the Jedi, the non-Jedi Master General Leia. So it's Leia's faith in Ray that inspires her, not Luke's. Oh, <laughs> oh God. Okay, listen. I like Leia too. She's an integral part of Star Wars. She's a badass female character who was not the star of Star Wars. It's a Luke. It's the Skywalker saga. She is still Leia Organa. I understand if maybe she wants the respect and inspiration from both of them, but I'm glad that Luke is there to tell her that Leia, who was barely in the Disney trilogy, they had so much faith in her, they knocked her out for half of The Last Jedi because let's be honest here let's be real honest I, I love Carrie Fisher she did not put in the best performance in the Disney trilogy okay it just that's why they put her in little as possible and they cut out most of her scenes from the first movie all this lip service of how great Carrie Fisher was she she hadn't been acting in a while she's had a ton of personal problems she did the best she could but we're just talking about a film objectively uh, and Disney's full of shite. Uh, but Luke responds by telling her that Leia has not completed her training and has not yet feel uh, yet felt her distinctive consciousness within the Force. I'm also being told that one change that comes about is made clear that Luke and Leia both knew... Oh, this part is great. So I'm also being told that one change, and I'm being sarcastic, that has come about is... They've made it clear that Luke and Leia both knew of Rey's heritage. This knowledge contributed to Luke's hesitancy to train her. But in the end, it's about your heart and not your genes that really matters. The former opening flashback of the film has been moved here. But as far as I know, we no longer we are no longer going to see it happen, but instead have the story of Leia's last day of training told to us by Luke. A source tells me that it's stated in this scene that Leia gave up the Jedi path because she had a vision of her chi her child would die and she sought to prevent that. Luke apparently goes on to say that Rey inspired Leia to pick up the path of the Jedi once again and now it's a thousand now a thousand generations live in you as it, the first teaser said. Oh, are you guys convinced? Uh, again, this is Jar Jar Abrams characterization. Let's have Leia be a Jedi off screen, off screen. Uh, and it's simply a stepping stone for Ray. Luke is simply a stepping stone for Ray. Uh, oh, and they lied to her the whole time. 
just like Obi-Wan did because this is Return, Return of the Jedi. Return of the Return of the Jedi. And, you know, I know I know, I said this in my last Jedi review, but um, episode six was Return of the Jedi. So, like, we got one Jedi. Uh, and episode eight was the last Jedi. <laughs> it's like... Uh, I've always, and Jar Jar, again, he's such a bad writer. Luke was, remember, Luke was lost in legend in 30 years. Remember the myths of Ronald Reagan, a mythical leader from some land uh, called America? It was 30 years ago where, where a former actor became president. I know it's mythology. We can, we, I'm not sure if we can confirm it or not, but that's what I've heard. Um, by the end of their conversation, Ray is reorganized for the seemingly ins- insurmountable task that lies ahead of her. Yeah, like ending this series, uh, making us believe that she's an actual character and fitting all this into one movie. Oh, my God. So, <clears throat> like, this scene right here is probably going to be like five minutes. <laughs> it's going to be so bad. Uh, Luke gifts Ray with a lightsaber along the way. God damn, such Mary Sue. Oh, awesome character. Thinks she isn't awesome anymore. And then somebody tells her she's awesome again. And they make her double awesomer by giving her all their awesome stuff. Here, take my lightsaber. Take Leia's lightsaber. Uh, no, no, you're still awesome. You, you know what? You know what your problem is? You don't know how awesome you are. That's your problem. You are not aware of how awesome you are and always been. You make me feel better. You complete me as a human being. My, I should worship you. I'm going to drink your urine. You're so awesome. Okay, that went a little dark. Apparently, Luke kept Leia's saber with his personal effects and tells shows, uh, and tells shows Ray where to get it because she's awesome. Uh, the Resistance crew finds out about Leia's death, death once they arrive in the base. There is equally as much mourning for the whole team. Apparently, Chewie, who cries. So this is why they could not kill Leia in The Last Jedi. They could not have Luke complete Rey's training. That cannot happen because the political message in this movie from Disney, the family-friendly company, uh, is is uh, a a message of intersectional feminism and a, and a anti-family message, which we'll get to at the end. So Disney, the family friendly company that wants you to buy Christmas presents, but one of their companies, Marvel can't say the word Christmas, but they still want you to buy the Christmas presents, uh, is, is distinctly anti-family at this point. So, uh, an anti-father, 100% 100% anti-father. Previously, Ray transmitted cord- coordinates to the Resistance, but it appears to have changed. I'm told that Finn reveals informations, information from Dio, the little hairdryer, that leads to Exogol. Uh, with Dio having found uh, this on Uchi's ship, uh, and the Resistance discovers that Uchi visited Palpatine long ago when he was first given the mission to capture Ray, and Dio can tell them how to get back there. I'm told the resistance takes off one direction while the Falcon takes off in another. Apparently the blockade runner seen in the fleet is being piloted by Silliston and a young uh, Monkai, Monkai, Moncalamari can be seen in the fleet as well. A source also tells me that uh, a royal, the royal guards of some sort are present for Ray's meeting with Sidious. Uh, okay, so they got rid of the dyad concept, which was supposed to be Ray, Raylo, basically. Uh, they Palpatine says that Luke always had his father to say it, save him, so it was just a uh, it was just a foregone conclusion that Darth Vader would save Luke Skywalker and become Anakin again. So Palpatine sacrificed his empire and was willing to wait 30 years and die being thrown into a pit because he always knew he had plan B and they're never going to answer definitively how Palpatine gets back. Now, maybe they reshoot that in the last minute Um, because here's how Jar Jar Abrams, this is my theory, how he gets away with a lot of shit. 
uh, because because he lacks so much talent, but he's so incredibly good at manipulating people and talking people into stuff that he could convince people that it's okay to kill Han Solo. He could convince people that it's okay to not really have a backstory for Ray. He could convince people that he could remake A New Hope and call it his own and that he's paying homage. I mean, he's he's good. He's really good. Best bullshit artist in Hollywood. It's earned him a half a billion dollars. He bullshitted Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers, you have time to get out of this. Get out of it. There's a guy named Todd Phillips. I would give the DC Universe to Todd Phillips at this point. All right. Now, I've already gone over this in the video. Uh, Palpatine <clears throat> and uh, Raylo fight. Uh, Kylo Ren falls to his death. And uh, a thousand generations live in Ray. She defeats the Emperor. They go back to uh, uh, back to Tatooine, and she calls herself Skywalker because your family name doesn't mean anything. Uh, your descendants don't mean anything, especially if they're bad. Uh, and we don't want to carry on their name. We don't want to carry on the name of the past. You want to kill the past. Well, they're not talking about the past of Star Wars. They're talking about the past. You need to kill the past, not learn from it, kill it. And Palpatine is victorious. Palpatine victorious. His lineage lives on. The Skywalkers are extinct. Tell me how that's a victory. Tell me how ending the Skywalker saga is a victory by some girl just taking Skywalker's name. Um, uh, that's not understanding fantasy. That's not... That, uh. So... Palpatine victorious, J.J. Abrams uh, gets a big paycheck and uh, and fuck all to everybody else. God, that pissed me off. Sorry. Woo! How's everybody doing? <laughs> Shit! Ugh! That is so... I'm going to cuss again. That is so fucking bad. That is so fucking bad. That is worse than The Last Jedi. Palpatine victorious. Honestly, if he'd have killed Ray and killed Luke and killed everybody, I'd be okay with that. Him and a couple of demon Ewoks making their way through the galaxy. Hell yes. Give me that. But Luke, we we get we waited decades to see Luke as a Jedi master. Decades. That's all we wanted. And some little round-headed twerp was given the decision that, oh, we're not going to do that. That would be expected. <laughs> hmm. May may that be a scarlet letter on his directorial, di directory, uh, his creative life. I can't talk. I'm so upset. His creative life for the, for the rest of his life. May he never forget that he made the worst creative decision in the history of film. Uh, followed by Jar Jar Abrams. The Jar Jar Abrams started all this. I think Jar Jar Abrams was b behind uh, the ditching of the EU. I don't think Kathleen Kennedy knew anything about this shit. So I think she brought these people on and let them do whatever the hell they want. Uh, and didn't supervise them. And she would, I doubt she even checked in. And there's precedence. Lord and Miller were doing 70% of their movie before she decided to check in and, and nix it. And then they went on to win an Academy Award. Not that that means much, but I don't think her judgment is very good. I'm just saying her judgment isn't very good. Ooh. So Luke was just a stepping stone for Rey. Han, stepping stone for Rey. Anakin, stepping stone for Rey. Yoda, stepping stone for Rey. Uh, Qui-Gon Jinn, stepping stone for Rey. He's probably completely forgotten. Obi-Wan, nothing. Rey. Uh, it all led up to her. It all led up to this. Uh, do you think that's a satisfying ending? And how about this? What kind of government is in place? Do we have a new, new Republic? Do they even address this? Uh, was the first order in control? Uh, they call him Supreme leader, but I never got a sense of the world. I never got a sense that the new Republic was in control. Cause I never got a sense of the new Republic. The world building in this has been shit. Um, we go to five different de desert planets. Um, yeah, it's, it's, and I wonder why they pick so many, uh, is it easier to shoot? It must be easier to shoot at a desert desert planet. Uh, maybe it's easier for effects or something. I'm not sure. Uh, somebody will have to answer that for me, but mother fracker, man. 
it's going to be interesting to see. Here's what I think is going to happen. I'm uh, going to happen. When I was reviewing Game of Thrones with Doomcock, uh, I, when Game of Thrones season eight, I, I wasn't on board. I hated season seven. I hated it, but I was willing to come back and, and give it a shot. Unlike Star Wars. I'm like, I'm still, a, I am still to this day, a Song of Ice and Fire fan. I love the books. So I wanted to see something in. So I reviewed the first episode and it was okay. It was okay for, I thought they wasted a little time, but I thought it was okay. I'm like, this is going in a good direction. It had a great ending. It had a great ending. And it felt like old Game of Thrones at the end. I'm like, oh, that is awesome. Then the second episode happens and I'm like, uh, it was okay. Doomcock liked it better than I did. But again, I thought they wasted a bunch of time. And then there's like six op- episodes left. And then I heard that the uh, battle, the battle at Winterfeld, Feld, Winterfell, Winterfeld. Uh, they, it was the most expensive episode. That the third episode, Winterfell, was. Uh, it's not called Winterfell. I forgot what it was called. Uh, the Long Night. The, uh, the third episode, The Long Night, was the most expensive episode. And I started working it out in my brain. I'm like, oh, they're blowing their wad in this episode. They're gonna kill the Night King. Uh, and then I let somebody talk me out of it. I'm like, ah, they couldn't kill the night King in one episode. They couldn't have eight years of lead up and kill him in one episode, but they did. Um, but even my light criticisms for game of Thrones in the first two episodes, I was getting a lot of shit. Uh, and also my, my light criticisms for star Trek discovery season one, I was getting a lot of shit and my light criticisms of doctor who in the first couple episodes, I was getting a lot of shit episode four of doctor who episode four of season one of star Trek discovery. All of a sudden I started getting a lot less shit. Uh, my, my like ratio started changing. Same thing happened with game of Thrones. When people realized that it was all a big effing waste of time, even the people who hung on to the very end, that's when the tide turned. Now there are some unbelievable shills and hacks and people with bad taste who like game of Thrones season eight and thought it was a satisfying ending. You'd be wrong. Dan and Dave have come out and said they didn't know what they were doing. So uh, uh, for all those people who tell me it was planned, uh, no, it wasn't. (laughs) It wasn't. Um, They just wanted to get the hell out of there because they were in over their heads. Go do your research on that one. So you're going to find out after this episode definitively because the people still hanging on still think that they might get Luke back or something might get answered or there'll be a a big payoff and that we were just being a little too prejudgmental. And Listen, that could be the case. There's a small possibility that could be the case. Much more likely, this thing turns into be a total shit show like The Long Night. And honestly, people were still hanging on after that. It was not until the bells when the dam broke on Game of Thrones. This is going to be the dam breaking on Star Wars. When people see at the end that that Rey just takes... And you can hear it all day long. It's not until you see it, okay? And most people out there most normies are not I, I wish they were but they're not watching my videos they don't know about these leaks and they will be surprised at the end and when she takes on the name of skywalker with luke dead leia dead han dead and palpatine out survived them all that's gonna piss a lot of people off a lot of people off why do you think baby yoda's out there right now look at the baby yoda everybody look at the baby yoda Look at the ba- baby Yoda's cute, huh? Baby Yoda's cool. Wait, wait a minute. Ray is a Skywalker, although the Palpatine baby Yoda. But wait a minute. What happened to the Republic? Baby Yoda. How did Palpatine survive? Baby Yoda. God damn it. Ah. Fuckers, man. If John would okay, what would John Favreau do? I think that's what uh, anybody who's working on Star Wars, need to ask themselves, Favreau and Filoni. What would Favreau and Filoni do? Don't ask what George Lucas would do. Don't. I love George. Little midichlorian guys riding around in spaceships in your blood system. That's not a good idea. That's not a, I love George. I love you. I do. I do. You, I mean, you don't like me, but, uh, so I, yeah, quick story, story time with Gary. I went on a tour at Skywalker Ranch in 2000 what year did revenge of the sith come out was it 2005 four five three i can't remember it was the year before revenge of the sith came out uh, a friend of mine john reed uh who used to be the co-host on the show uh 
got me on Lucas Ranch. We did a tour. I got to see where they recorded the music. Uh, I got to see the winery there. And I ran into Rick McCallum and George Lucas. They were working on Revenge of the Sith. At, and uh, he had a bunch of Norman Rockwells in, in his, uh, he has the entire United Artists Library in this giant library that's got multiple tiers, a big glass domed window. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, and ran into George and gave me the dirtiest look. He didn't know who, he doesn't know who I am. He was, he was busy working and he was like, who are these, you know, who are these plebes walking around my house? Um, and I almost touched the Norman Rockwell right after my friend told me not to touch it, but I couldn't, I don't know. It was like, I was drawn to it. I went, <gasps> and the, and he, right before the alarm went off, it was bad. But, uh, when I got there, I was on a do not enter list. No shit. So we got there and they're like, Gary, you can't come in. I'm like, why? This is before YouTube. This, I had a, I had a, I had my shop for a year. And I wasn't a fan of the clone that, you know, uh, of the prequels, but I was just telling people in my shop, I don't know how the hell, well, how the hell, well, it turns out that Lucas's security is better than Tesla's than some of the governments. Uh, they were able to look a little bit into my past and realize I had a bit of a record <laughs> and they wouldn't let me on. Um, and, uh, Luckily, John's friend talked them into letting me in, uh, but I was, on, I was, yeah, I was on a do not, uh, I was on a blacklist, uh, but it was because of, uh, they, they looked up, they, uh, for all guests, they do a background, they do a background check. It's very, it's top notch security right there. And again, this is stuff that Tesla didn't find out. Toyota didn't find out. Uh, the government didn't find out. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, David Morris, thank you for the super chat. John J M two eight for ten pounds. What about ye? Oh, I, did I read this one? I'm sorry. Thank you again, John. Captain Spire for two dollars. I I I I I want the knife, please. Um, you want the knife, like literally? Yes. Uh, that knife. I wish could. If somebody would be kind enough to DM me that on Twist, uh, like Christy or, do you know where a picture of that knife is? Could. Could you DM me that on Twitter? I want to show you guys the knife. It's, it looks like a toy. Uh, Wes Moody for 555. Hail Nerdrotic. Have you ever thought about doing a live stream in front of an audience with a Q&A and interactions during the stream? Uh, Hail Fandom Menace. Um, oh, I would totally do that. That's a great idea. I would do that. Yeah. Uh, I've, have I thought about it before? I haven't thought about it but I would most certainly do it. Uh, I don't know. Um, you know what? I'm going to LA, uh, a, uh, a week from Saturday and maybe we can get some of the LA YouTubers and maybe we could go get a place together and do a meetup and do like a live stream, like a, like not just a live stream on somebody's phone at a coffee shop, like do a live stream. That'd be pretty fun. Like a holiday live stream. Maybe we can make it for charity or something. And, uh, I don't know. I'm just thinking of this now. Uh, I will work on, I'm, I've got a two hour drive ahead of me. I have to go up to Santa Rosa. It's not that far, but it's afternoon traffic. And, uh, I will work that out of my brain while I'm doing that two hour drive. And maybe it's, and maybe it's something we can't do this month. Maybe we do it next month. I don't know, but I like that idea. I would love to do it. Uh, th listen, the only reason I go to cons now is just to hang out with people, meet, meet the, meet the fandom menace, uh, meet the nerd erotics, hang out. I had such a good time at comic-con. We didn't go. We went to Disneyland. There was a bunch of fandom menace. People went to Disneyland. It was so much goddamn fun. Uh, and I want a quick shout out to proper Jeremy out there. Uh, good YouTuber, good friend, great guy. Great guy. So shout out to proper Jeremy. Love you, man. Uh, and hopefully I get to see him in, in a week. Uh, maybe I'll see Jesse from Mindless Entertainment. And uh, there's other LA peeps we can see. Uh, RK Outpost, if I make it to San Diego. David Morris for 10 pounds. Bjork was gloriously woke. She was uh, beyond woke. She means it. Doesn't want to just raise taxes. Amazing visuals. Uh, talk of using tech plus nature to fix the earth. And her voice, it was paradise. Hail Mrs. Nerdrotic. Yeah, she's she's woke as hell, but she's talented. 
and she is a a living embodiment of a pixie little fairy. And uh, I like Bjork. Okay, I I do. I don't care about her politics. She's a, a a an amazing artist, and she has an amazing voice. Uh, Ray was created by the Emperor, just like Anakin was made by by Darth Plagueis. Plagueis. Uh, that's why she has such a strong connection to the Skywalkers. Uh, the prophecy is also meant for Ray, not Anakin. She is the one to bring balance to the Force. Ray and Kylo put an end to the Sith and Jedi. Uh, I don't buy that. Uh, that sounded very added on at the end. Um, if Ray was a character I liked and Kylo was a, here's where agenda Jesse. And that that's, that's a good point. And that's where it fits into the story. And it sounds good on paper. And I'll tell you where I thank you for the five dollar super chats. I appreciate it, but I tell you where it falls apart in execution. I don't buy Ray as the chosen one because they decided to make this character unlikable from the get go and not write her with any complexity. Also, Kylo could not defeat Ray. The reason they couldn't have Kylo defeating Ray is because Ray ha- cannot uh, we can't have a, f- a woman losing to a man. So you deviate from narrative structure for agenda. The st- any storyteller would have told you that Kylo had to defeat her at least twice badly. She would have to walk away injured, missing a hand, something. If you really wanted to truly mirror the story and make Ray's journey feel earned, she had to get her ass handed to her a couple times. Not the resistance getting their asses handed to her, Ray getting her asses handed to her. And that's where they try to mix you up. They're all the resistance did get their asses handed to them. Yeah, by the first order. And Ky- this is not about the first order versus the resistance. This is about Ray versus Kylo. And Kylo is a bitch. Kylo's not a threat. He's laughable. He's a joke. He's a cartoon. And the reason they did that is because they could not have him, him beating her. Not once. Because agenda. It's not a narrative decision. You deviated from just normal narrative structure because of agenda. And if they tell me they didn't, they're lying. They're lying. Jar Jar's a liar. They have to lie. They have to professionally lie. And I do understand that. If somebody figures out your story and asks you a question about it, you can't say, yep, they're right. No, I get it. I get it. Um, but I saw John Campia put out a video saying uh, Jar Jar Abrams smashes those tests, those dumb test screening theories. Did he? Did he, John? Did he? Because I heard him say right after that, there were test screenings for friends and families. That's a test screening. So what are we arguing over here? Semantics? Um, so... Now, Doomcock mentioned that there were, this is from his source. This is not Doomcock. He's just relaying information that there was a paid test screening. I don't think so. I don't think they would do that. Uh, And there would have to be NDAs for one. Uh, But friends and family screenings, again, I've been to them. I've been to one in the last calendar year. One that was put together hastily for a creative on the show so his friends and family could see it because he couldn't make the original screening. So the company put this screening together and allowed family and friends. And guess what? There was a bunch of websites there. There was a bunch of strangers there. Uh, We were told verbally not to spoil anything, but we didn't have to sign shit. They gave us some hats and we walked away and I did a spoiler free review of the boys. I'm not saying rise of Skywalker was the same thing. Okay. But I, See, J.J. could have just said, we didn't do any test screenings. Why didn't he just say that? Why did he qualify it with, oh, there was stuff for friends and family because there was test screenings. It's semantics we're arguing over. So, and listen, I know that John Campia has his nose firmly up Jar Jar Abrams' ass. So he probably knows him personally and he probably knows the information and he probably doesn't tell it to you because you can't trust him because he's a shill. Um... Like a horrible one. So I love his co-host though, Robert Meyer Burnett. 
is one of the best people down there. He's uh, he's the best part of entertainment media. And if more people were like Robert Meyer Burnett, there wouldn't be a problem. If they weren't smug arseholes like his partner, there is problems like that. And believe me, I usually don't go after YouTubers. The, the YouTube shills are just as bad, if not worse, than the access media that I've been going after. And they are as responsible as anyone for the creation of the Fandom Menace. John Campia, you can sign your name on the bottom of creator of the Fandom Menace. And you know what? All you had to do was be honest, man. And your channel would probably still be getting very good traction. I mean, it's decent traction, but it should be getting better. Uh, you know, just considering how many subs he's got. And, uh, and it's probably because of a connection with your audience. Um, I promise you, I don't need, uh, I'll go to a screening. If somebody invites me, it will never affect my opinion. And I probably won't get invited back. And I don't care. I don't care. I was invited on the set for the Orville. If the Orville goes woke, I will tell you, I will be the first to tell you. Uh, but the Orville respects their fans. You might not agree with the show's politics all the time. Hell, I don't, but, and I don't agree with Seth's politics, but Seth, respects the other side okay he, he might not like your politics but he wants you to watch his show and he doesn't hate you as well i don't think he hates you as a person because of your one decision on some politics uh and that's why there should be more seth's uh that, that guy of the dick and fart joke uh happens to be one of the most one of the smartest writers in hollywood one of the most clever writers in hollywood uh who was capable of writing great drama uh and Watch the Orville. It's a great, great show, and it's just going to get better. I, uh, I've seen, th I've seen things. I know things about season three that I have signed uh, an NDA, so I cannot talk about it. Nor would I. I would never spoil it for you. All I can say is get very excited, get ready to laugh, and get ready to be excited because uh, shit's getting turned up. I think they got some of that Hulu money. Now that I don't know. That's my speculation. Uh, D for Canadian $5. Good storytelling is not about subverting expectations. It is about fulfilling expectations, but in unexpected ways. Thank you. Also, you should stream with EVS. Sure. I talked to EVS, uh, New York Comic Con. Uh, you know what? I'll, uh, I'll get him on. I'll ask him to come on soon. He's busy. He's, he's trying to crank out a second book. He got the first book out. Uh, it looks pretty damn good. To be honest with you. Looks pretty solid. I like the design work on it. Uh, I love his logo. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, D, for Canadian $5. Uh, Lady Miss, for $20, recently watching Star Wars with friends, I told them I didn't understand the passion of the hardcore followers. It's great, but, a st but still a story. Everyone laughed at me and said, almost together, Lord of the Rings. I get it now, LOL, right? <laughs> Uh, Lord of the Rings is the GOAT. Greatest trilogy of all time. I don't think that's arguable at this point. Uh, I think it's surpassed Star Wars as the greatest franchise of all time. And as... Uh, you know what? The Hobbit was its prequels. It certainly was. But The Hobbit is are as good as the prequels. As a matter of fact, I think they're a little better. But, um, you know, it, they're not good. They're not good. Uh, Slit... SLW Bear for Canadian, or I'm sorry, two pounds. Hail Gary, you say shite like Scott. Nice. Shite. Uh, you know, I love you guys. Well, I'm I'm an Anglophile, so. Um, dreary, thank you, by the way. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, Mrs. Nerdorotic always laughed because when I was in uh, you know what when I'm in when I'm in another country, I try to do as do as the Romans do. So I was in London and everybody said cheers and I had no idea what that meant. I'm like, why are they saying yay? Because over here, cheers is like, you know, you know, it's like a, a, a salute, you know, cheers. Uh, but it's thank you over there. And I didn't know this at the time, but now I do. And now I say it all the time. But I used to say cheers, dude. And she thought it was pretty funny. So I mix in a little SoCal there. I've been out of SoCal for a while, but dude was in every, was every other word, dude, like dude, you know, like Freddie Prince Jr. I sounded like that. Um, that's SoCal speak dreary nitpicker for four ninety nine. Holy crap. You cracked the code. I never thought about it like that. Baby Yoda is a diversion to the failure of episode nine. Hail Gary. Hail baby. Yoda is a distraction, a very cute, adorable 
good distraction that you, I mean, if you get a baby Yoda for your little toddler, they're going to freaking love it. Oh my God. And there's nothing like a little toddler smile. Is there, um, crazy pineapple for $10 Disney star Wars, all about Palpatine, a Palpatine brought imbalance to the force and Palpatine restores balance. Yet they have the, <laughs> the effing nerve to call it the Skywalker saga. Uh, and episode nine, the rise of Skywalker. It's the rise of Palpatine, crazy pal. And he did, he did. And you think about it, he, he fixed his own problem, probably unintentionally. Listen, it, it was never supposed to be about Palpatine. It was an Anakin story. Palpatine wasn't even in uh, my God. They recast him for the third movie. He just showed up for a second in the second movie. He was just supposed to be something scarier than Vader, but Vader was still the focus. It was about Luke and Vader. This isn't about the Skywalker saga. They, they are so full of shit. Remember when Lando was freaking awesome? Yes. Uh, then every agenda had to toss their letters into his name and claim him as theirs and instead of making their own. Exactly. And that's what that's what's being done right now. Instead of making their own, they're trying to force their way into uh, our franchises, which they can do organically and nobody has a problem with it. Yet, uh, they'll be destroyed, uh, left in pieces, and the true blue nerds who are going to stick around no matter what are going to be there left. Leave, uh, you know, I've got another, I've got, a, they'll be left there picking up the pieces. I've got enough things that I can get into where I don't need Star Wars. There's plenty of stuff that can't ever be ruined by them that I can enjoy that they'll have never heard of uh, because they only want what's relevant. And that's that fucking word I keep hearing related to Star Trek and Star Wars. Fuck relevant. I heard that with Star, with Superman too. And Neil Gaiman of all people said, Superman isn't relevant. He's inspiring. Star Trek isn't relevant. It's inspiring. It's timeless. Star Wars is the same. Take your relevant word and shove it firmly up your very puckered ass. Uh, I love dork chicks. I love dorky chicks for $5. I do too. I definitely do too. Uh, they're, they're, well, they're smarter and a lot of other things. I'll just leave it there. I don't want to be crass. Uh, respect, uh, respect the ladies, uh, the dorky ladies for sure. Uh, Gary last weekend, I went to LA from Dallas to see Slayer's last show and it was cold as fuck. It was even sleeting in Simi Valley. What the hell? What do you mean? Last show like ever? Uh, yes, it, uh, it can get cold there. Uh, LA is a desert. So, uh, in, in, in the winter time in San Diego and parts of San Diego and LA, it gets below freezing. Did you people not know that? It just doesn't snow there. But in East County and Riverside and Escondido down in San Diego, yeah, it gets below 32 degrees regularly in the winter. Uh, but you get closer to the coast. But the thing is, it, it's it's weird. You, you drive six miles towards the ocean and the temperature goes up 20 degrees. It's a desert. It's extremes. It's, it's like, um, it's not like desert, like Mojave desert. It's uh, a Mediterranean environment. Uh, John J M 28 for 10 pounds. I appreciate you to reading out my Irish slang earlier. I, I, sorry, I messed it up. I really am. I was an extra on the long night and I was there when they filmed the night, uh, King's death. I seen so many, what the fuck got your anger is rightly placed. You were there. Oh, John email me, dude. Email me Gary at nerdrotic.com. That's awesome that you were there. Yeah, all I remember is the director of that episode was talking like he was going to a salt mine every day. And as somebody who worked uh, prison labor for 25 cents a day, I just find it very hard to, to hear people wearing Gucci talking about how hard they worked. And I'm sure it was hard work. You know what? This is hard work. It's fun, though. I wouldn't call this work. I wouldn't equate this to doing lawns and gardens at Folsom. For 25 cents a day and being treated like, well, like a human stain. Um, 
it, because I deserved it. I deserved it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, Jay Bird the Third for ten dollars. The woke claim they only want to include new diverse characters, but instead of respecting and coexisting with them, the new characters always put down the originals and steal their accomplishments. Yes. And that's what we have a problem with. We don't have a problem with these new characters, and they know that. that that's, this is why they are manipulative pieces of shit. Because they are subverting these characters, and they're doing it on purpose. And they're all, what? We're just doing inclusivity. You get, Wait a minute. You're against, you don't like gay people? You don't like people of color? You're a racist. This shit has got to stop, and it's Hollywood who did this shit. It's the creatives. It is the billion-dollar corporations the same ones that own 60 Minutes that went after YouTube, and uh, don't believe me, I haven't forgotten about that. That's Friday Night Tights. We're discussing that on Friday Night Tights. Freaking Grandma Leslie Stahl going after YouTubers. Uh, I, I, yeah, that that one I'm talking about. But no, they've Alex Kurtzman, who, by the way, is a political operative. Uh, we, we will still have time. I'm going to get to that next. He's a political operative. And they're using Star Trek to sway an election. Fuck Alex Kurtzman too. Canadian Highlander for Canadian $2. Hey Gary, did you see a vid on the Rise of Skywalker cast react to the end? Yes, I did. Uh, I included it in my last video. Uh, it's at the end of my last video. Uh, and I compared it to, I compared it to em Amelia Clark's. I love Amelia Clark, by the way. She is, uh, I don't know how much range she has, but she's honestly one of the sweetest people in the world. So uh, I could never be mad at her. Um, she's super charming, and yeah, I, I dig her. She's got a good charity, and I hope she has a long career, successful career. So hail Amelia Clark. She's, she's freaking cute. She's nice uh, and a good person. But her reaction was just like Daisy Ridley's. So I put them right next to each other. Uh, it's a long video. I don't expect you to watch them all. It's okay. It was 18 minutes. Uh, but YouTube like the, likes those now. They like the almost 20 minute videos. Um, they also like other things I've figured out. But I don't know. That's why my videos are taking longer because I'm I'm editing them. I'm not just uh, and I don't write. So I come up. I have to sit there and come up with something in my head, and I don't write it down. Uh, I hope this is okay, Gary. Reminder to you all, and it's okay. Please support executive producer Joe Malazzi's SG Twitter storm tomorrow, December 6th for a non-woke Stargate. Yes. No, that is totally okay. So uh, am I saying Malazzi? Joe Malazzi, uh, Stargate Twitter storm tomorrow, December 6th for a non-woke Stargate. Make it happen. Thank you. Bird of Prey 5. Did you really sign the petition? I did. <laughs> I did, Bird of Prey 5. <laughs> I did. Uh, Trask. Uh, shit talker. Uh, sh okay, what is it? Starker Wars. The Rise of sh Shylocker. Shark Starker Wars. The Rise of Shylocker. Shylocker. Thank you, Trask, for $2. I don't know what that might be slang that I don't understand. I'm sorry. Uh, you can elaborate in the chat. Don't send another super chat. Uh, the space horses are Jar Jar's cheap ripoff of Lord of the Rings. Ride of the Rohirrim. You're right. Oh my God. You're right. Steffi. Oh, hell. Yeah. They're going to, Oh my God. They are going Lord of the Rings at the end. Thank you for a great show from Germany. The space horses are there ripping off Lords of the Ring. God damn, J Jar Jar's got no, uh, he's got no pride and no taste. Uh, thank you for the shout out. Can't wait to see you. There is Justin Proper right there. Pro oh, formerly Proper, Proper Jeremy for $2. Thank you. Lance Higa. And it, yes, I can't wait to see you too, man. I'll see you in a week. Uh, keep being awesome. Lance Higa. He got for five dollars. Nerdrotic EVS cross pollination would be a win for the fandom menace. Sure, absolutely. The uh, and the fandom menace has been winning a lot lately. It's been winning a lot lately. Captain Spire, did you watch the Lego Star Wars commercial? I did not. The Falcon smashed into the Sith ship. It's like they're telling kids, "See, it's cool." The Falcon blew up. I heard they took that out, but I'm I'm glad they did. And I uh, seeing the Falcon blow. You know what? You blow it up. Go ahead. Blow up the Falcon, blow up Luke's X-Wing, go back and blow up his land speeder, blow up his lightsaber, 
and blow up the goddamn franchise while you're at it. Oh, you did that already. Thanks, Jar Jar. Lady Gravemaster for $2. JJ doesn't deserve to be called Jar Jar after this. He doesn't. Lady Gravemaster, you are correct. Calling Jar Jar Abrams Jar Jar is a disgrace to Jar Jar Binks. I think you're right. Anton Ada uh, Bill Burke uh, is a proto molecule member and welcome. Uh, Lyle Trill for 100 Norwegian crones. Thank you very much. And no statement there, but thank you. Uh, you guys keep the lights on here. You keep the content flowing, and I appreciate you. Output Panther for $5. I am more excited for the Rise of Skywalker train wreck uh, than for good Star Wars. Disney may think trolling Star Wars fans is the only way to get them into the theater. And I think you're right. And honestly, I've already bought the popcorn that I'm going to make for December 19th and 20th because I'm going to watch a world-class bullshitters video, a geeks and gamers video, a doomcock video, uh, eventually a Mahler video, uh, that star Wars girl video, a drunk three PO video, a Justin proper video. I'm going to watch them all. It's author Stephen Walton video. And you know what? I'll make my own too. I'll make my own two Midnight's Edge video. It's going to be the best two nights uh, in YouTube history. Maybe YouTube history. Um, the end of Game of Thrones was a big night. Uh, I think this will be much, much bigger. Much bigger. So uh, we'll see. I mean, I don't think I'll have 24,000 people watching me live uh, like I did that night. That was crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, if two people show up, I'll be fine. If nobody shows up, I'll be fine because I'll need to vent. But I'll need you guys, too. I do. I need you. The Fandom Menace needs you because you are the Fandom Menace. Again, this channel is not a Fandom Menace channel. I am a fan. I like the hashtag. Uh, we agree on a lot of things. But we can also if uh, we can also scatter to the four winds because they can't catch us all. They can't catch them all. They can't. Uh, Output Panther, thank you for becoming a member at the proto-molecule level. Logic Noodles for Australian $10. G'day, Gary. I really hope Alex Kurtzman isn't related to the great Harvey Kurtzman. Oh, I'll check. I'll check. We're getting to him next. JPRPH1, 499. Dad moving out of ICU today. Yes. Thanks for the content. It's been great distraction. You are most welcome, JPRPH1. And I'm glad your dad is moving out of the ICU. Give him all my best. That is good news. Get him home for the holidays. Uh, Tyrone Beard for Australian $5. I have watched your AA vid every day and going to detox on Thursday next week and then rehab. Your freaking inspiration, brother. Thank you, Tyrone. Oh, my God. Okay, stay strong. Email me, please. Uh, have a good support network. Have people to call. Uh, it's, I'm, that's amazing that you're doing that. That is strong. That is strong and it's tough. And you'll make it. Uh, and things do get oh, so much better. They do. It takes a little while, but life will, uh, life becomes easier, less complicated. Um, and you have something that a lot of people don't, perspective. Perspective of, of how bad things really can get. Uh, try to focus on what you're grateful for, but just have somebody to talk to. Okay, please. Uh, email me and tell me your progress. Gary at nerdrotic.com, please. Uh, some nobody, and, and I wish you all the luck. I'm praying for you, man. Uh, some nobody for $2. We, we do it cause it makes him mad though. Jar Jar brainless. I know. And I'm going to stick with it too. <clears throat> it's just a very good point. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Sip of Pete's for the working man. David Morris for two pounds. When, where are you coming to the UK? A uh, Wales. There's a comic con in Wales, uh, that Mrs. Nerdrotic and I will be going to. I'm hoping to meet Mahler. That's uh, that's one of my goals. I don't know if he wants to be met, though. I mean, that's that's kind of a broad assumption on my part, but maybe he wants to remain anonymous, and I understand that. But uh, I love going to the UK. So um, it'll be early part of next year, David, and I will let you know. Pay attention to the Twitter. Miles Mulholland for two Canadian dollars. Hail Gary Game uh, G8 Show just subscribed. Oh, G8 Show. I'm an idiot. Sorry. Great show. Just subscribe to DVD Epic. Yeah, no, do, subscribe to Doomcock, man. He's awesome. He is my brother. Uh, what's up, Mikey Woods? Welcome, by the way. Uh, Pity Cab Avenger, it was showing last week in the mountains above Lake Elsinore. What was? What was? Oh, it was snowing. It was snowing. It was? 
in Lake Elsinore. Damn. That's a low, that's a low. Okay, so let's get to Alex Kletzman, shall we? Ooh, this one's tough. I think we'll just go over, uh, we'll do, we'll, uh, we'll go over Bounding Into Comics. Let's give Bounding Into Comics a clip. Uh, hail John F. Trent at Bounding Into Comics. Good friend. Hung out with him in New York. Uh, and we sat through the Antifa panel. Woo! I want to talk about cringe. Cringe. Okay. Here we go. I may dip in out because I, I need to show you something from the Vanity Fair article. So we will go over to that, but we're going to stick with this. <clears throat> Alex Kurtzman admits a condition for him hiring doing Star Trek was not having another male captain. Of course, when I saw this, I tweeted out the mummy director gave conditions before signing on to destroy Star Trek. And then I put about 10 laughing emojis and a couple puking emojis. Alex Kurtzman gave conditions before signing on to Star Trek. Uh, maybe I think what really happened was he manipulated and backstabbed Brian Fuller and took over Star Trek. I don't think there were any conditions. Alex Kurtzman, I'm calling you a liar. A liar. You fucked over, by the way, a gay man, Brian Fuller, uh, one who's got more talent in one of his pubic hairs than you do in your entire body. And I'm not the biggest Brian. Listen, Brian Fuller is is hit and miss. Uh, but I'll tell you right now, he got screwed over as much as the Dean did by this asshat, in my opinion. Uh, I know the Star Trek Drekkies have been dying for me to talk about Star Trek. They've been waiting so long to troll me and Photoshop my face on Nazis uh, and get some relevance. Uh, keep doing it. I just will ignore you. Um, actually, the only time I, the only thing I, the only reason I know that happened is because Mrs. Nerdrotic brought it up to me. Um, uh, Mrs. Nerdrotic, who, uh, and, and listen, Drekkies, you had all the, you had ample opportunity at New York Comic Con, at San Diego Comic Con, and at Star Trek Las Vegas to come up and talk to me. And, and let me know your grievances or, or call me an isterophobe to my face. And guess what? Nobody did. Not a single person did. Huh. Funny how that works, isn't it? Star Trek executive producer Alex Klutzman admitted a condition for him doing Star Trek was not having another male captain. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Kurtzman and CBS All Access Executive Vice President Julie McNamara were asked by Joy Press, Star Trek Discovery stars a number of women of color. Can you tell me about the conversation behind that? Kurtzman responded, about three years ago when CBS asked me to consider doing another Star Trek, my instinct was, it's got to be a woman, it's got to be a woman of color, I'm not interested in having another male captain. Um, I seem to remember this being Brian Fuller's decision. Wasn't this Brian? I mean, I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure it was Brian Fuller who said that. I mean, I guess Alex Kurtzman was producing it. and But again, I was always under the impression it was Brian Fuller who said that. Uh, he then made it clear it was a condition of his involvement with Star Trek. Uh, we made it very clear in a condition of my involvement with Julie immediately supportive of this. The, uh, then Kurtzman revealed that he and the casting team questioned whether they should cast a man on the morning of Donald Trump was elected president. <clears throat> uh, and here we go. And one thing I remember very clearly was that we were still casting morning. We were still casting the morning Trump was elected and somehow in the casting conversation, this question came up like, oh, do we have to reconsider this? And we doubled down and said, this is exactly why we have to do this right now. Um, this is a total lie. Total lie. Now, I believe their casting decision was influenced by the election, but I don't think they were ever thinking about casting a man. Um, they... They are using Star Trek 
for political agenda. And uh, they're not really secretive about it. When you, when we, I'm going to go to the Vanity Fair article and show you a couple other projects uh, Alex Kurtzman's working on. Uh, the producer followed up uh, the comment by admitting that he finds it more difficult to write males as compared to females. <clears throat> And for me personally, I have a hard time writing men. That's the truth. I don't know why. It's always been the case. Okay. Cringiest statement ever made by a man. Nobody ever says this. Nobody ever means this. This statement right here before I get into the pure cringe is shows you how full of shit this dude is. This is what this is a male feminist. I would, women, I would steer so fucking clear of this dude. And I don't care what his persuasion is. I don't know what it is. He could like dudes. He could like men. I would, I would stay the fuck away from this guy. I wouldn't let this guy, I would lock shit around him because he steals stuff. In my opinion, I wouldn't let him in my house. And I wouldn't let him anywhere near my fucking kids. Um, in my opinion, anybody who would make a statement like a man has never been able to write men. Then you are a shitty writer, buddy. But I added the tweet here. We'll, we'll go over to the tweet. Uh, what did my tweet say? I don't usually show my own tweets, but um, do, 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 do. there we go. Uh, I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, yeah, good. Okay, you can see it. Uh, and, and for me personally, I've had a, tar I've had a harder time. And for me personally, I've had a harder time writing men and women and children, and dogs, empty boxes, and grocery lists. And that's the truth. I don't know why. It's always been the case. Alex Kurtzman. I thought that was better. I thought that was a little more appropriate, to be honest with you. But, uh, yeah, and this is the other, you know, when, when I shared the article, director of the mummy, Alex Kurtzman, gave conditions before signing to destroy Star Trek. Are you fracking kidding me? All right, so we go over here. <clears throat> And the reason I don't want to go there's a bunch of goddamn pop-ups. Uh, they're bringing back the L word. L word. You know, um, I have to admit, when the L word originally aired, uh, I watched it and I got hooked on that stupid fucking show. It was terrible. Uh, there was some. Uh, there's lots of lesbian sex, but there was uh, there was a plot that I mean, it was like a soap opera. And I like listen. I like my soap operas, um, and it was woke for the day. But this was before all the woke shit was happening and it was driving me crazy. Uh, but yeah, I will not watch the new version. I imagine it'll be bad. So uh, he mentions this. Uh, 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 the writer's room for Picard and Patrick Stewart was well as novelist Michael Chabon, Chabon and Elliot Waldman. Uh, it must have been an interesting room. Yes, it was a lot of strong voices, but the thing was great about everybody. Yeah, I'm sure they were all ratting each other out. Uh, what happened to um, Akiva Goldsman? I thought he was uh, writing on the show. Uh, where's Akiva? Akiva Goldsman is the worst writer in Hollywood next to Kurtzman. Uh, here, we go down here. <clears throat> uh, Michelle Yeoh is going to be a lead uh, of a spinoff based on her role as Philippa Georgiou. Where are you with that show? We are very excited about Section 30, the Section 31 show with Michelle Yeoh. Uh, is excited to do it too. She is in the current season of Star Trek Discovery, and she's working on that right now. But we have scripts getting written, and Alex has a writer's room. We, we love what we've heard so far. It's yet another, ton it's another tonality of Trek. As Alex has mapped it all out, each show has its own unique sort of voice. What's the tonality of this one? Uh, we, what we don't want is for you to watch one show and be like, well, I don't really need to watch that Star Trek because I already watched Discovery or whatever. So to me, Section 31 is sort of like a black op CIA division of Star Trek. And it's established... Uh, it was established in Deep Space Nine. Full credit goes to Michelle Yao for coming to me and saying in season one before we had launched it, I want to do a spinoff of my character. With Michelle Yo. it's very hard to say no. Um, by the way, they haven't said yes to the show yet. They got a writer's room. They're writing scripts. 
It has not been ordered to series. And uh, there's no word of that. Uh, and I want them, by the way, okay, I always sidestep this, but I'm not going to do it anymore. Erica Lippold and Byo Young Kim are the two writers who have been in the writer's room since day one for Star Trek Discovery. They're, they're little soap opera CW writers. Um, they are the ones responsible for most of the cringe Trek. I haven't mentioned them by name until right now. I've always kind of sidestepped it because, uh, you know, listen, I don't care if you're a man or woman. I don't care what color you are. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of women out there that know Star Trek much better than I do. These two women do not. These two women are responsible for some of the worst writing in Star Trek. They need to be called out for it now. They will be writing the Section 31 show Michelle Yeoh's character is absolutely cringe, and I like her as an actress quite a bit, um, but she's awful. She's awful as the bad Philippa Georgiou, and I pray they make this show. Please make this show. This is what I want for Christmas. I want A-Force movie, and I want Section 31. I want it to happen. Uh, da, 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 da. We're talking about inclusivity. We're also talking about terms of age, too, because there are some seasoned actors and actresses. Uh, yeah. And blah, blah, blah. The real tug of war hair over talent these days. Why go with CBS? <clears throat> this is a hilarious question. There is a real tug and war over talent these days. Why go to CBS? Because they're the only ones who would take them. Uh, Julie and I met, was it 18 years ago? We have a long relationship with uh, each other. And yeah, a lot of inclusivity, by the way. They've known each other for 18 years. And this guy keeps getting work and he sucks. Uh, he has not created anything that is good, not a single thing yet. He keeps getting work yet. I bet you there's a lot of women out there that write better than Alex Kurtzman and that he's holding their slot, uh, which shouldn't matter though. Merit matters and his merit sucks. So Julie never, uh, never says this is what you can or can't do what you can, you can dream what you can and dream up. And how can I make it possible on networks? There's origin time constraints and there's rules about what you can do or what you can't say. We don't have any of those structures at, at any of those structures at all ass. <clears throat> Here we go. You are working on a mini series together about James Comey. The news moves so fast and it's impossible to imagine what a political world will look like when your project is ready. Does that matter? <clears throat> In other words, the mainstream media lies are being debunked so much faster now, it's impossible to make a, a biopic, but, but Kurtzman tells you, it doesn't matter. Uh, Kurtzman, and listen to what he says. I don't think it will be because it is honestly a documentation of what happened. It has been crafted to be a historical record. We actually are not interested in rewriting the past. We are actually not interested in rewriting the past. Fucker. That's all you've been doing in Star Trek. But when you do a James Comey show. Oh, okay. Okay. Many people. Uh, many people are, but we're not. Oh my God. This guy's full of shit. <laughs> Oh my God, this guy is so full of shit. Uh, and I'm sure this will be a very fair and balanced story about Comey. As a character, Comey is not your, your prestige cable antihero. He's divisive. We all have bias. We are all like, he's the guy who ch whose choices ended up turning the election. Um... No, no, uh, no, I don't care what side you're on. That is not a truthful statement. Uh, somebody else's choices, Mr. Kurtzman end up turning the, turning the election. Uh, the, and, uh, that person was interviewed on Stern show yesterday. What a freaking sellout that dude is. Uh, but we don't talk about politics. So that's what I wanted to point out. That's what I wanted to point out. This guy's hypocrisy. So when it's writing a Comey story, he doesn't want to rewrite history. But when it's Star Trek, <laughs> let me whip out my, my two-inch wiener and pee all over it. Yeah. Sorry. I get a little... I, 
I, I've had, I guess I've had a lot of pent up Star Trek stuff because I haven't talked about it since, since August very much. And quite frankly, nobody cares anymore. Um, here's some, uh, insider information from you again. Uh, this insider, my insider might be, uh, might not be there anymore because of the merger. The merger just happened. Uh, and I don't know, but, uh, and you've heard this before, but this was exclusively for my insider. The short treks are being watched by no one and they are half of what was projected as far as viewership goes. So they are getting half the views that the previous short treks got, which were next to nothing. Uh, nobody's watching these except for like little itsy bitsy channels that, uh, like to shill for Star Trek. But, and, and the last two were terrible. One was nine minutes long and they managed to make it terrible, utterly terrible. Um, and what we got, we got two animated ones coming up. What, uh, next Thursday, next Thursday. Um, and all the short treks had Pike in them. So they thought they would get more people watching. You notice the short treks didn't have any of the Star Trek Discovery crew. So my guess is if Picard is successful, uh, they will say that Star Trek Discovery was always planned for three seasons. That's my guess. I could be wrong, but that's my guess. Because they are they, they do want to spit out more Trek, but everything relies on Picard. And CBS has a bunch of, now that the merger has happened, they have a lot of extra cash they need to get into the streaming wars. Uh, Sherry Redstone says she wants to uh, be the king of content, and she's probably going to try to do it. Uh, the thing is, she is in bed with Alex Kurtzman. I don't know if she likes him or not. I, he's a Moonvis guy, but he's such a good ass kisser. I can see him sticking around. So we're stuck with Kurtzman. Star Trek is dead. Uh, the best we could get probably is a mediocre Picard, and we'll see if that happens. Uh, it's going to be great to see them together. I'm not going to lie. It's going to be great to see them together. But to see them inside of an Alex Kurtzman joint, and by the way, we heard the Borg are going to look different now. Uh, the Borg are going to probably be 25% different. Everything's going to be 25% different. Fuck Kurtzman, man. That sucks. That Star Trek is going to get wasted on this. And CBS All Access is doomed. Uh, they had this big head start on Disney Plus and HBO Max, and they blew it waiting for a merger. So they're, they're basically starting right now, and they're cooked. They're toast. <clears throat> the the expanse which is coming out in what do we got eight days is much better than star trek and we will we will get into that let me get to you guys a little bit here uh that fired me up though it did Miles Mulholland, thank you for the Canadian $2. $10 message retracted. Sorry. Uh, Byron Yoder for $100. Holy crap. Is it time to pressure our lawmakers to pull copyright back to a more reasonable time? 30 years should be long enough for a creator to earn from their work, but short enough that they, enti they enter the social conscious and become part of our lore and history. And that was the original. That was what was originally planned for, yes, we should pressure our lawmakers. If we really want to do something big as the Phantom Menace, we get that changed. You, you know what? You want to get revenge? Uh, sorry, my camera's... I moved my camera. I didn't realize it. Um, you want to get back at Disney Star Wars? You want a way to poke them back? There's a way we could do it. Uh, large numbers of people pressuring a politician and we'd ha it'd have to be a lot of us because Disney would be paying them off on the other side to change that copyright law to 30 years. And that's it. And Mickey mouse is gone. And uh, yeah, uh, 30 years. That would be great. That would fuck them so badly. Oh my God. That, that would be a way to get back. I like that idea. Thank you, Byron. I do. I don't know if it could happen, but that, I would, that, that would certainly, you know what, just remember ah, these fights are long. They are, uh, all, you know what, if you're ever feeling like, man, I'm tired of this fight, go back and watch the last Jedi. Just go back and watch it. 
Go back and watch Star Trek Discovery. Go back and watch Doctor Who Series 11. Just watch five minutes of it. It all comes back to you. Rome wasn't built in the day. Okay. Uh, Wayward Astronaut for $10. Uh, Kurtzman has trouble writing almost everything. I'm pretty sure he has trouble writing a coherent shopping list. It probably looks something like this. Uh, P, eggs, and milk, and car battery, and P, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's great. Uh, RR for $1.99. Hail, Gary. Hail, another great nooner. Thank you. You are quite welcome. Uh, Cinnabon Bunny for $5. I like that. Uh, thank you again for your support. A name change, uh, name change day will be a historic event talked about by scholars for centuries to come. Se hashtag up. Uh, Alpaca life, alpaca life. Uh, that's that's your name change, bird. Uh, Paleo geek Chris, four ninety nine. Ha 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 ha. You said Kurtzman was filling a woman's slot. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, I don't think he's ever done that, to be honest with you. Joel Tumburo for five dollars. Want to see a strong female character and not a Mary Sue? Watch Kick Ass and Kick Ass Two, and look at Hit Girl. I have seen those. I am a big Mark Millar fan. Uh, I love the first Kick-Ass. I didn't think the second Kick-Ass was that great. It was okay, but uh, I love the first Kick-Ass. Uh, but Hit Girl, yeah, Hit Girl and uh, Big Daddy. Big Daddy. Uh, but you're right, Joel. Thank you for the coffee. Thank you for the coffee. All right. Uh, the last rant of the day will be about The Expanse. The Expanse is coming on the 13th of this month. And as far as I know... Um, uh, Amazon is going to release it all at once. Uh, the expanse is about to make the biggest mistake in the history of the show. It will be a memory by mid January. Um, unfortunately I don't have time to pull out the numbers, but I will just give you this, uh, based on Doomcock and myself, uh, doing, I would do three videos a week on the expanse if they released weekly. I would say average views, I'll go on the low side, will be 50,000 each video. If Doomcock did the same, say Doomcock does two videos. We're counting our live streams. He gets 50,000 each. So that is, if you do the math, it's 250,000 views per week you are giving up. So in two weeks' time, that's a half a million. Four weeks' time, that is a million just from two little YouTubers. Then you put on Emergency Awesome. Then you put on Alt Shift X. Alt Shift, Alt Shift X would get a million views per video. He'll probably do one, maybe two a week, but I'm guessing one per episode. Uh, that's a million views. So you have, what, 13 episodes? That's 13 million views just from Alt Shift X. Uh, if Charlie decides to take it on an emergency awesome, say he gets a half a million views per video. So that's 7 million views you're giving up. So you got, what, 3, 13, 16, 20 million views between three YouTube channels. That's a low estimate. That is free advertising that you would get total if you released weekly. People would be talking about it every night. There will be podcasts, discussion, what's going to happen next episode, water cooler episodes. That's, if you, do you want an episode where 18 million people watch your show? Do you want that expanse? Because you're not going to get it with the binge model. But if you release weekly, you could. 18 million people watched Game of Thrones, episode one, season eight. If you become the biggest show in the world and the heir apparent, 18 million people would watch one episode of television. And that's not counting the free advertising, which was in the multiple, multiple millions after that episode aired on YouTube alone. We're not counting Twitter hashtags or Instagram hashtags or Facebook posts, just YouTube. Um, I'll tell you right now, by The Expanse giving up, releasing their show weekly, they are giving up advertising not even Amazon, not even Jeff Bezos could afford. Free advertising that you couldn't afford. And I have not heard any argument that tells me the binge model is better than releasing weekly. Because it doesn't exist. This is one I know I'm right on. I know I'm right. Because you could binge it later. So why would you do this? To stay competitive with Netflix? 
Uh, don't worry about it. Release weekly. Differentiate yourself from Netflix. The Boys was one of the bigger shows this year, and guess what? It would be bigger if you had if you were would have released it weekly. It would have been a bigger show. It would have been the biggest show. It would have been a monster hit. It would have been the heir apparent to Game of Thrones. Look at stupid Watchmen. Watchmen sucks. Uh, and maybe that's what they're worried about. But even shitty reviews are reviews. It's free clicks. The Boys is a million times better than Watchmen, but more people are talking about Watchmen and less people are watching it. Release weekly, Expanse. Uh, you, you could change your mind right now. There's nothing in the world that says you have to release this all at once. Don't do it. Listen to me. Listen to me now. Believe me later. You know what? If, if there's some a-hole there who's convincing you, you need to fire that person or, or to give that person a firm talking to that they don't know what they're fucking talking about. I don't care what your data and your research says. I study analytics every day. Every day. My own. TV ratings. The Expanse will get talked about. It will peak uh, December 13th. People will talk about it for about a week, maybe two weeks. After January 1st, it'll be a memory. And and do not hire Parrot Analytics. Uh, that, that, that thing is full of shit. Um, I can do, I can tell you right now. The Watchmen, the last episode, of, uh, episode uh, not last week, but the week before of Watchmen, was watched by 625,000 people overnight. And it trended number... Th- uh, no, wait, hang on. It trended number three on Twitter last week, and I'm going to get the numbers now. I'm going to see what last episode was. TV series finale. And I will extrapolate for you how many people were watching Star Trek Discovery, and I will tell you how many people aren't going to watch your show, The Expanse. And this is very easy to figure out. I've been covering TV for five years here now, so I've done my homework. Here we go. Let's take a look at those Wokeman ratings, shall we? Uh, Okay, so they went down 19% uh, after the incredibly woke episode. And amazing enough, uh, the, the, the less woke episode bounces back to what it was normal, but it's maintained. Uh, the audience hasn't really grown. It hasn't really shrunk. Uh, it's a very mediocre show. So you have a very, the 18 to 49 demo is incredibly low. Uh, your viewers in millions. So last week, 779,000 people watched your show overnight and a major character returned at the end. Well, we didn't see them, but they talked about, they talked about Dr. Manhattan. So that's something that should trend on Twitter. And it only trended number three and 779,000 people watch your show. So Star Trek Discovery never trends when it airs, never trends. So my guess is it's half of what, uh, or less than half than what watches the Watchmen. Somewhere around 200,000 people watch Star Trek Discovery. Now that's about how many people are going to watch The Expanse. And if you drop it all at once, it'll be, yeah, it'll be right around 200,000 people, 300,000 people. It won't be a million uh, because that's the expanse wasn't getting that before. You haven't grown your fan base very much. You could by releasing weekly, but you're not going to listen to me. So I tried, I tried everybody. I tried to, uh, to, you know, I was part of the save the expanse. Uh, and you know, I got no love for that, which is fine. I don't need it. It doesn't matter. Uh, and I'm going to talk about your show. I want to talk about it more, but if they release all at once, then I'm only going to do one video. One. Sorry. That's all you get if you release it. Cause like, I'm listen, um, <clears throat> nobody watches episodic reviews when the show is binged. And the, the uh, I have cracked the code a little bit. You can get away of, with three reviews. If you do a review of the first episode, the entire season, and discuss the final episode, you could probably eke out some views with that. I don't want to do that, though. So I'm going to probably do, I might do two. 
I'm going to do a live stream with Doomcock because I promised to do it on his channel. And what sucks is we agreed. Uh, I said, Doomcock, why don't you? I invited him on for Game of Thrones. And then I was going to go over and do Expanse on his channel. That was part of the deal. Uh, and he gets screwed because you guys didn't release weekly. That sucks. That sucks. All right, let's get back to you guys. Uh, all right, man, we still have 21. We had uh, 20, what, six? At one, I guess I alienated a lot of people. But we are 1,100 likes. Thank you. We have still over 2,100 people watching. You guys are brilliant. I have been on for two hours and 38 minutes, and it's uh, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, Joel Timberl, thank you again uh, for the super chat, and let's get to... Uh, Gary, how many of these views do you think people, uh, why does it jump on me? Uh, how many of these views do you think are morbidly curious because people actually hate the Watchmen? I would say a third, a third. Uh, I think it's that hated. Uh, HBO was free on cable this past week. Wonder if it increased Watchmen viewers. Uh, Jessica Hodge, it must've been. I think that's uh, probably, but it didn't increase it by that much. No, um, there's no gain, though, if you compare it to the uh, Westworld's ratings. Uh, Watch Watchmen's going to be one and done. There, there's not going to be another season of Watchmen. If there is, Damon Lindelof won't be part of it. So it's uh, it's one and done. The only thing I've liked about it is it's got a great soundtrack by Trent Reznor. Uh, you are welcome. They... Uh, uh, do it for them. Weekly we episode watch party review. Some nobody for two dollars. I I almost should just to show them, just to show them. But they're not listening to me. I'm too toxic. I'm too. Speaking of toxic, let's uh, let's open up some toxic mailbag, shall we? Just a couple things. Uh, let's see what we got here. What do we got here? Uh -oh. da, 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 da. From the Destiny Captain. The Lost Room. Thank you. I know you talked about this. I just wanted to show that I did get it. I will watch it. I appreciate you, Destiny Captain. And, oh, I wanted to show this. This is from Eric K. Eric K sent me uh figma spider-man and a deadpool so these things are badass these are going on the wall of wonder so thank you i, I I'll, I'll do some letter reading on on uh on next one uh, probably saturday but uh my p.o box is uh it is nerdrotic care of gary beekler 236 west portal avenue number nine san francisco california 94112 uh, you can find it on my website, nerdrotic.com. That's where my live stream schedule is. Uh, I'm going to take off. I'm going to take off because I got to get prepared to go on Creature Features tonight. So Creature Features is a local TV show on Coffee TV 20. And Bob Wilkins used to host it in the 70s. He's kind of a Bay Area legend. And we're going to watch a B horror movie. And I need to watch the movie because I haven't seen it yet. So I need to see it before I uh, get up there. And... Um, and be able to talk about it. So that's my next move. I'm going to watch it and take my notes. So uh, everybody, thank you for watching the Nerd Rodic Nooner. They will be back regularly, okay? Uh, after the first of the year, they're going to be at 10.30 or 11 a.m. Monday and Wednesday. I really miss doing these. I love doing these. And live streaming is actually my favorite thing to do. Sorry I've gotten out of habit, but a lot of things have happened. Uh, the channel has grown. So thank you again um, to all the new subscribers. Please make sure you are still subscribed. Please do that with your favorite YouTuber. Uh, be sure to tune in to Doomcock's live stream tonight. So Friday Night Frolic Frolics will be on his channel tonight, I imagine, at 4 or 5. But pay, pay attention to his Twitter. Uh, I'll uh, probably be in the chat in the early part of it before I go um, do my interview. Uh, pay attention to my Twitter. I'll be uh, doing some videos from from Creature Features, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m. for The Mandalorian. For The Mandalorian. And then, of course, Friday Night Tights, 5 p.m. with Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers, Comics Division, Odin's Movie Blog, 
bear, 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 nerd fun. And I don't know who else. I, I still have a, a, a slot or two open. So uh, we, we will get those filled. Uh, I want to bring on a Patreon as well. So again, thank you very much. Thank you to the Mod Rodics. Everybody have a great, oh, a super chat came in. Uh, uh, John JM28 for two pounds sent email images included and extra on Gao2. Uh, did I just say Gao2? I just said Gao2 <laughs> on Game of Thrones. So it happens when you talk too long. <laughs> Gao2. Thanks for the Gao2. <laughs> oh. So Matthew Madsen, thank you. Chris Persia, thank you. According to Christy, thank you. Uh, thank you to with the five new members we got. You guys are brilliant. I will see you tomorrow. Remember, not all who wander are lost, but they might be Gao too. <laughs>